Okay, guys, so, so good morning. Um, my name's Craig Abad, I'm, I'm the president of Kerasoft, and I wanna welcome everybody to the Kerasoft Collaboration Center. We're hosting a lot of events like this. There's a few people who've been here, uh, been here before for some, for some uh, recent events, and I wanna uh, thank everybody and welcome everybody to, uh, to the building. Um, uh, so on behalf of uh, Kerasoft and Google, I'd like to first off extend our sincere gratitude to the folks at um, NIH and NCI and uh, uh, ARPA-H and the Uniform Services University for participating in today's event. And um, thank all of the federal healthcare community and partners um, for being here and collaborating uh, with Kerasoft and, and Google today. Um, these events don't uh, get done uh, easily and they don't get done without um, some really good partnerships and sponsorships. And on the other side uh, of the space um, and, and on this side, there's, there's a bunch of our sponsors. And if I can encourage everybody to go to every one of those sponsors booth and talk to them and ask them why they're here and what they're doing to help your missions in and be part of the, the community that, that's so vitally important to how you guys um, conduct your mission. Uh, um, Deloitte is here, uh, Palo Alto Networks is here, Onyx and Dastin, two, two great um, Google uh, reseller partners, integrator partners, um, Quantify, Virtru, ICF, um, Sintasa, Westwind, um, Translate Live, um, Aerotech um, are all partners that are here. And then there's also a booth for Google's Fitbit group and um, Google's Pixel group. So you'll get to meet some of the, some of the other teams within, within Google. So um, guys, as we, as we, we kick it off, um, I've been saying for the last year that if you, if you looked back a year ago, you would have said that technology was really, really moving at a really, really fast pace. But if you stay today and you look back at that data point a year ago, you go, wow, a year ago, technology was kind of moving slow compared to how fast technology is moving today. And I, I think as we all look for the partners in the room and, and the, the government agencies in the room, I think while there's an increase in energy and momentum and speed around um, um, new technologies um, being developed, new technologies coming to market. What's more important in our industry is that I think that our customers, that our government agencies don't just have an increase in, uh, um, don't just, aren't just watching and being part of this incre increase in, in speed of technology, but they're asking for technology to be deployed faster and your expectations of what technology can do for you is at, is at a really, really high level and pushing those expectations down to your industry partners is really, really important and something that we're all trying to help you with, with every day. Um, I met with a Google exec four or five years ago and one of the conversations was, hey, what's Google doing that's different? And in Google's case today, and, and lots of Google people are gonna tell you more profound and important stuff, but in Google's case today, they've got one view is a, a, a workspace uh, business uh, and a collaboration business, and one business is a, is a cloud and an infrastructure business. And one really, really important business is, is an AI business. Um, and when you combine all three of those things, you end up with some really, really powerful stuff. But I asked the Google exec five years ago, hey, so what are you guys doing different and where are you gonna differentiate? And the very first thing they said was, we are really gonna be a leader in this healthcare space and using all of this Google technology and energy around supporting um, healthcare missions for the government and healthcare missions for, for, for the country. And so um, I'd offer, today's a really cool to see um, 200 people from industry uh, and government here 
to understand and learn more about about what that Google exec told told me five um, five five years ago. So I'd like to now introduce um, a really a cornerstone supporter of today's event. Uh, she shares a passion for driving modernization within the government healthcare space. Um, the federal healthcare account director for Google Cloud, for the Google Cloud practice, Patrice Walters. So thank you, Patrice. This is incredibly exciting and it is so great to see all of you. I appreciate the time you're taking out of your schedule, your busy schedules to be here with us today. So welcome to Google Cloud, the healthcare symposium. I'm Patrice Walters. I am the account director for Google Cloud. Um, and I first wanna thank Craig and the Kerasoft team, Harjeet Khalsa, Kelly McGilloway, Kelly Mullen, Brittany Tobin, and the entire Kerasoft team for allowing us to use this wonderful space uh, for this event. So during breaks, I do wanna uh, double click a little bit on what Craig had just said. I really want um, one of the actions today to be a networking event. I want you to get to know each other and I want you to talk to the partners that are here, um, set up on the left side of the room here. Uh, please talk to them, ask them questions, get curious about what they're doing with Google Cloud. We will have time during breaks and at lunch, so lunch will be at 12 o'clock and will be served across the hallway. Uh, but we will have time after you grab your lunch. Uh, feel free again to, to make this a networking opportunity to talk to all of our partners here. Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a person who is responsible for creating the Google Cloud federal healthcare team, a dedicated team to serve all of you and your mission. Tedra Burgess is the manage, managing director for Google, Google Cloud Healthcare. And I'd like to have her come up and she's gonna have uh, introduce Dr. Nadja West. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Tedra Burgess, absolutely delighted uh, to be here with you all today. Um, and I, I too want to take a moment to thank um, our host and sponsor and all of our partner sponsors, the entire Kerasoft team. And, and, and we're gonna give, I'm gonna ask you to give a, a special applause to, to Patrice Walters because the passion that she has um, for healthcare for this space comes from somewhere very deep and very personal, and it is evident in the way that she has put um, so much uh, soul into what she's been able to put together today. So thank you, Patrice. Thank you. So as I said, we are thrilled to have you all join us today uh, for a day just full of exploring how Google Cloud um, and cutting edge AI are transforming the future of healthcare. Um, Throughout the day, you're gonna hear from industry experts um, as well as Google Cloud leadership who are gonna share their valuable insights and experiences with you as well. While she wasn't able to join us in person, um, it is my pleasure to introduce a brief video from Dr. Nadja West, um, who is one of our esteemed board members of our Google Public Sector Advisory Board. If you're not familiar with Dr. Nadja West, she served as the 44th Surgeon General of the U.S. Army and is also the former Commanding General of the United States Army Medical Command. Uh, with her role at, um, with regard to the Surgeon General role, she's the first woman and the first black person to, to hold that role. Nadja has um, spent so much time with us behind the scenes sharing her passions, her experiences, um, and uh, her passion for innovation on what she knows that we can accomplish uh, together. So without further ado, very happy to share um, the video welcome from Dr. West. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nadia West, and it is such a pleasure to join you today as you participate in Google Cloud's Healthcare Symposium. You know, I spent over 30 years as a soldier and medical professional in our United States Army. I had the privilege of providing direct patient care as a family physician, and dermatologists in both the garrison and the deployed environments. And I had the honor to serve in several leadership positions 
you know, community hospitals, medical centers, and regional medical commands. I served in operational units and had joint assignments where I had the opportunity to work with colleagues from my sister services, as well as medical professionals from our ally and partner militaries. And my career culminated with the awesome privilege of serving as the 44th U.S. Army Surgeon General and the Commanding General of the United States Army Medical Command. And during that time, I saw the delivery of healthcare advance from paper medical records, handwritten prescription, and literally trips to the lab to physically scan ledger books for the results of patient lab work. I've seen it transition then now to electronic health records, online prescription ordering, and automated lab retrieval. And now I say all that to say that innovation in the healthcare space is critical in ensuring that our patients have timely access to the best and safest modalities to prevent illness and disease and to recover from illness and disease should they contract them or from injuries should they sustain them. You know, when I learned that Google is an innovator and a leader in the healthcare industry, an AI that's deeply interested in health with entities such as Google Health Equity Team, the Google Research and DeepMind that continue to drive new capabilities that assist providers in better assisting their patients. I was happy to accept the invitation to join the advisory board of Google Public Sector. I believe that generative AI presents an opportunity to accelerate and improve health and public health. I see where it can reduce provider burnout by offloading tasks and allowing providers to operate at the highest levels of their training and their credentials, similar to how the automated lab retrieval supplanted flipping through handwritten ledgers. I see how it can better target health interventions and how it can augment the public health workforce. And also during these times when every sector faces the threat of cyber attacks and other malicious interference, I can see how AI can better protect the safety of medications and healthcare supply chains. I also see how it can protect privacy while unlocking the power of access to, da uh, to data to positively impact health by rapidly sharing successes in cancer treatment, for instance. And when I was the commander of Womack Army Medical Center at Fort Liberty, North Carolina, I had the honor of making several visits to the Taylor Sandry Medical Simulation Training Center, named for Lieutenant Colonel Mark Taylor, an Army General Surgeon, and Sergeant Matt Sandry, who was a combat medic, both of the 82nd Airborne Division, who were killed in action while serving those soldiers entrusted to their care. The state-of-the-art simulation center has the purpose of training medical personnel in a realistic scenario-based environment so that they are prepared to act in a real-life combat casualty situation. I believe generative AI has the ability to enhance and scale the training provided in simulation centers such as these and add additional capabilities to train an endless number of skills required to accomplish the missions that our nation asks of all of the healthcare professionals in every sector of our government. Now, I know that the Google team has assembled an incredible lineup of speakers from the NIH Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, the Surgical Critical Care Initiative, and the Uniformed Services, among others, along with the Google Healthcare leaders. So without further ado, I wish you a very productive symposium. Take care. I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. West in October, and she is an amazing woman, and we are very lucky to have her on the Google board. So thank you, Dr. West. So I'd like to introduce the panel uh, for the day, which is very exciting. We have so many uh, uh, great, mod a great moderator and a wonderful panel ahead of us. So first, I'm going to introduce Dr. Monica Burrell. She is the clinical lead for public sector health at Google. She is a physician, executive, internist, and public health innovator focused on using the power of data and analytics to drive innovations and e equity in health. As a member of the Google Health team, she contributes to the work of the Population Environmental Health Mental Health Center for Excellence and the cloud public sector teams. Dr. Monica Burrell previously served as a senior advisor to the mayor of Boston. She was appointed by Mayor Wu to lead the city's response to the humanitarian crisis, 
in the area known as Mass and Cass. She oversaw a public health equity led approach focused on individual medical and treatment needs and it is my honor to introduce Dr. Monica Burrell as our moderator today. It is also my privilege to introduce Mr. Bakul Patel. He's a senior director for global digital health strategy and regulatory at Google focused on building a unified digital health strategy that is aligned with evolving global regulatory needs. Mr. Patel's vision is to help realize the potential of technology and its role in democratizing access to high quality, equitable healthcare. Prior to joining Google, Mr. Patel held the position of the Chief Data Health Officer of Global Strategy and Innovation and Director for Digital Health Center of Excellence at the US Food and Drug Administration. In these roles, he provided thought leadership and expertise and shape responsible regulation for digital health. Mr. Patel's vision for his role at Google is to help realize the potential of digital health that is poised to be a game changer and heralding a new era for healthcare. Please welcome Bakul Patel. Nick Weber. Nick is a scientific computing services director and strides initiative lead at the National Institutes of Health. Nick is an inspiring leader in the field of scientific computing. He embodies a collaborative spirit that fosters an environment where scientists and computing experts work seamlessly together. Nick's leadership in collaborating with many technology partners is helping to build advanced solutions that accelerate our understanding of health and disease. And Nick did not know I was gonna say any of that, but welcome Nick. Welcome Dr. Seth Schobel. Seth is the scientific director for the SC2I and an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery. He has a background in cell biology and molecular genetics. He obtained his master's of science from John Hopkins University and his PhD from the University of Maryland. As a scientific director of the SC2I, Dr. Schobel applies his bioinformatics and data science background to develop cloud-based big data anal analytics capabilities, including machine learning applications for real-world clinical decision support tools. Welcome, Dr. Schobel. Our next panelist is a driving force behind some of the most ambitious healthcare innovations of our time. Please join me in welcoming Gerardo Castaneda, the Chief Technology Officer at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. Gerardo's vision and leadership are instrumental in shaping a future where bold ideas merge with cutting edge technologies to transform health outcomes. Welcome, Gerardo. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you so much for those introductions. Good to be here with all of you. Good morning. Wonderful to be here today to talk about the intersection of innovation in technology and public sector health. Um, today you'll hear about current applications of this technology, as well as the art of the possible. So we wanted to start out by talking with you a little bit about those two areas. Um, I came to believe in the transformative capacity of technology in public sector health from my time in city and state government. When I ran the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, we created a data platform that was cross-agency integrated across our silos of information. And that proved to be revolutionary in the way that we looked at the approach to our complex health issues. We went from looking at silo disease-based programs to really looking at individuals at a holistic level and targeting our resources to those who needed them most and being able to measure impact. We use these data silos, they still use them today. We use these data platforms to look at complex health issues, including addressing the opiate epidemic during COVID-19 and addressing maternal mortality disparities. So I really believe that there is a space between the private and public sector where we can innovate and use the new technologies. Because where are we now? We are in an area of rapid 
rapid innovation and transformation that can really be beneficial to improving the health and outcomes of those we care about and that you all are working to improve. There are such amazing innovations in the ability to automate data analysis, process data, identify patterns, and make predictions that can allow us to do our work in an enhanced way and to imagine the art of the possible. As we look towards the day, we have capacity, as we look forward to the day, we have capacity to do this in the areas of basic and clinical research, clinical care, and population and public health. And here with me uh, this morning, I have this esteemed group of individuals who we have a chance to talk with about their ideas about this art of the possible, their hopes, and also in this unique area of health, what some of the challenges might, might be. So I'm going to jump in and ask a couple of questions of our group. Gerardo, I'll start with you. Um, your group, the ARPHA, the, the ARPAH, um, has some aspirational goals and some really important and a really important mission. What is the potential and hope for AI in healthcare on the research side, and how do you think about that in your work? Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So thank you, Monica. And for those of you that don't know what ARPA H is, you know we're a rather new agency, and our mission is to advance health outcomes for everyone, right? And we do that by funding high impact, high risk health research that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So we think about this all the time, right? And uh, you know, to answer your question, I think that the impact of AI in health research is you know, tremendous. We, we got a taste of that not too long ago with the COVID pandemic, right? You know, it, uh, it took, what, 40, 42 days from the moment that the sequence of COVID was released to the moment that researchers had identified the protein that they, they wanted to, to target. And that's just crazy. You know, in, before that, it would have taken 10 years, right? So, and, and maybe, maybe many of the folks here, you know, from NIH and, and other areas were part of that. So thank you for saving my life, by the way. Really appreciate that. And uh, so, so, you know, that, that's great, right? But that's, that's just like a great kickoff. Uh, when I think about the power of AI for health research, I believe that it can impact every single activity in the whole pipeline from ideation to translation. So if you think about planning, you know, you have a researcher that is, you know, has an intuition about a certain idea, but uh, you can use AI to do brainstorming. You can use AI to find relevant literature, to read hundreds of thousands of papers. I was just looking at, you know, some of the stuff that you have on the screen here read 200,000 papers over lunch, right? And provide, provide summaries for that. You can use AI to plan your studies to identify what are the target populations. Uh, you can use AI to put all of that together, if, you know, to, so you can bring that to the research ethics board and get approval and funding. So that's just the planning piece. Then, then you move on to execution and the AI can be super helpful with that too, right? You can, you can run experiments to identify, experiments in silico, right? On, on the chip to identify what are the things that are gonna have the highest chances of success. You can have digital twins. AI can help you with the code for software to run your experiments and gather data. We all know that AI is good at handling massive amounts of data and uh, gather insights. And uh, then you move into, into the translation phase, which is you have all of the outcomes and the uh, you want to interpret the outcome, say I can help you compare your results with other data sets. You see if your interpretation is, is possible, maybe there's some, some alternative interpretations. Maybe you get funding to you know, bring that to market and uh, you, can, you can use AI to plan manufacturing and logistics. So you know, it's, it's just massive, right? And uh, just to give a couple of examples, I know we've been talking a lot, here, but you know, just, just two examples, little commercial on ARPA Health, couple of, of projects that we have, programs, we call them, uh, at ARPA Health that will undoubtedly use AI are Apex and React. So Apex is looking at uh, how do we eradicate the threat of viruses? And uh, what Andy Kilianski, the, the program manager is looking at is, can we manufacture vaccines that work at the genus of fa or family level? That's just crazy, right? And it's not crazy, it's amazing. At, at the edge of crazy, kind of. 
And the, the other one is is uh, is React, where where Paul Sheenan is and his team they are looking at the problem of non-adherence to medications, and uh, they are looking at the possibility of building two implantable devices. One of them would be a living pharmacy that would be delivering treatment molecules real time on demand, and the other one will be a sentinel that will be monitoring what's happening in your body, so you know patients and physicians can can make informed decisions. So this, yeah, I, I grew up watching movies about this kind of stuff. It was like sci-fi and we're doing it today, right? So super optimistic, I think it's amazing. Thank you, thank you. You, you know, I was gonna say, when you hear Gerardo speak about ARPA-H and all the work that's happening there, it almost sounds like sci-fi, right? But this is happening now. And as we think about, you know, you gave some great use um, cases and examples of how this work can be done in research. And speaking of research, um, Nick, NIH sets the tone for research across the US. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the role you see of these emerging technologies, like the Gen AI and quantum computing, how they play into the future of healthcare and research? Sure, thank you, Monica, happy to be here. Um, so I'm Nick Weber, I am from the NIH's Center for Information Technology, and to kind of give a little bit of background about NIH and you know, how we approach support for emerging technologies, we are 27 institutes and centers, National Institutes of Health, um, and we have research going on at um, our campus in Bethesda and, and other places, as well as a funder of research. And we fund about 300,000 investigators every year at about 2,500 research institutions and academic and medical centers across the country. And so um, we kind of look at uh, enabling research and enabling technologies um, in partnership with, with Google Cloud uh, in a number of ways. Uh, one of them to support the research that's going on at NIH is through something called the Strides Initiative, which is our partnership with um, Google Cloud as well as other cloud providers. And we've established uh, cloud platforms for all of NIH to use uh, to be able to you know, kind of securely um, conduct their research and collaborate uh, with others. And that's kind of the baseline, the, the foundation foundation of how we support these emerging technologies. So in those platforms, um, we have ready ability for any of our researchers to get started today um, using things like Gemini, using uh, MetaLM, using other models within those platforms. So thinking at a very foundational level, you know, kind of having that for everyone across NIH, uh, in, including, uh, and this is moving so fast, but tomorrow I'm meeting to figure out how we can integrate Gemini into our Google Workspace environment for additional uh, AI capabilities. Um, so I think that's an important part of enabling these technologies is to have those you know, strong foundations have you know, kind of the pieces in place for uh, doing things securely, uh, responsibly, um, and you know, enabling people to use the tools as opposed to be you know, afraid of what you know, might happen if they do something wrong. Uh, so that, that's a big foundation. And then with quantum, it's a very similar sort of you know, quantum as a service or AI as a service that uh, we like to offer through uh, platforms like Google Cloud where people can get access to um, you know, the quantum computers that uh, Google has partnerships with uh, to be able to test out workloads and do dr drug discovery or other activities um, you know, through Google Cloud and on these quantum computers um, you know, again today. And, and just a few examples uh, of what we're doing in this space. Uh, so one, I saw this last week and was, was you know, kind of blown away by um, how real the technology is and capable uh, it is today. Um, we have in our National Library of Medicine uh, a, a function, a service that they provide uh, where every year they get about 15,000 uh, inquiries that come in saying, you know, my, my brother was just diagnosed with cancer, or my, my uh, son has, you know, this affliction, um, I'd like to learn more. Um, and that service is really uh, for people uh, manually to go through and say, here's some uh, literature, here's some organizations, here's some things that can help. It doesn't give medical advice uh, purposefully, but it allows you to learn a little bit more about um, you know, what may be going on and what resources are out there for you to help uh, your family member or understand something about yourself. Um, and just in a, a very short um, period of time, we were able to, able to turn around in partnership with, with uh, Google folks, you know, kind of an automated, um, you know, set of responses to that, that you know, will enable, you know, what would take, a, a, you know, days for people to pull, pull all of that information in some cases to be near immediate responses uh, with useful information. Uh, and, you know, I just think of family members who may, um, you know, want to have that information and how that can be uh, at your fingertips is, is such an important um, uh, feature and function. So that's one example of many. Uh, we're doing clinical trials matching uh, using 
um, you know, uh, AI and LLMs to you know, find by putting in your um, medical information. Is there a clinical trial that you could participate in? Uh, match those up. Uh, be able to help support the incredible uh, work that you know clinical uh, clinical care and, and trials uh, that translate into you know potential new uh, drugs and treatments and uh, capabilities that you know we haven't had before. So. Those are a few of the examples. Uh, I'll speak to quantum since you mentioned it. Um, it's still in the early days of quantum. Uh, there's not a, you know, a ton of kind of practical, um, you know, full biomedical uses of quantum computing, but what we are seeing is kind of that translation between quantum and traditional computing where, for example, we may be able to um, use smaller data sets, I think for rare diseases or things that don't have a lot of data, uh, to use some quantum computing capabilities and develop algorithms that can work on a quantum computer uh, to train models where the sample size isn't large enough and then bring that back uh, into the traditional computing realm uh, to do you know, machine learning and other uh, capabilities against those you know, originally small uh, uh, data sets where there may only be 10 patients in the world that you know, suffer from a, a given uh, disease. So those are uh, some of the examples and capabilities, but I agree with Gerardo, just the possibilities are enormous. We're just you know, kind of hitting the, the uh, tip of the iceberg here, um, and I'm really excited to be a part of you know, how we can enable really smart people um, to do uh, really innovative things and, and help all of us in terms of our, our um, health and health outcomes. Thank you, Nick. You know, I really appreciate the um, examples you gave of helping family members. And then I, I think about when I um, was clinically seeing patients and how hard it was to navigate clinical trials that might be appropriate for them and how homogeneous clinical trial populations were and the potential for this to really improve that. So really appreciate um, those examples. And, you know, you spoke about um, public-private partnerships. And Bakul, I want to turn to you for a minute. Um, you know, from your position at Google, what do you see as the potential for public-private partnerships to address some of the key goals of federal healthcare partners that you're hearing about? And is there a role to play in some of the issues um, that they're mentioning and things that, like I mentioned earlier, data silos? And how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, thanks, Monica, and thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time at FDA thinking about public-private partnerships and trying to advance the field in, in a, from a policy perspective. Um, but if you think about the concept of digital health, it's it's really a translational thing that happens across the journey of a patient of a person. Let's not even call it a patient yet, because we may not be labeled as patient um, initially, right? Um, but I, I really want to take off from where Nick left off and talk about, you know, he talked about connecting patients to clinical trial. Now, those same kind of challenges are ex are also exhibited in when a pharma company or a medical device company wants to do the same exact thing. So I think that's one place that collaboration can be super helpful because the same problem set that is solved in one area can be solved in other areas. And the needs are very similar. So if you can think about from, from a public and a private perspective, I think there's lots of synergies there. And you can imagine just not NIH, but you can think about the National Library of Medicine, and then you can think about CMS and other areas that can sort of bring together this, this concept of the needs of the industry who's bringing technology, or not just technology, but also pharmaceuticals to the, to the market. They have the same needs. So that's one area to think about. I can also imagine a place where public-to-public -public partnership or also could be enhanced. Like, and Nick, you pointed out, and, you know, you pointed out, Gerardo, you pointed out about like this, this concepts about how can agencies that hold on to information, let's not use silos anymore because that's kind of a bad word, I feel, um, but hold on information for lack of not having interoperable standards to exchange this data between agencies. And there's, of course, there's lots of good reasons to, to have it set up the way it was set up. But I think if you start thinking about next steps, how should we sort of break those barriers down? What should that, that exchange look like? And how can we leverage information as opposed to data without actually moving it? And I, I, was, I would feel like that would probably take us to the next level of how can we take healthcare to where we need to be. Um, I'm gonna be very specific about the example for CMS. There's claims data. They have a very good initiative on the, uh, on able to for people to download their claims data, the Blue Button Initiative. 
can we sort of do more than that? I think that was that was done about about eight years ago or ten years ago. But can we actually take it to the next level? And can we actually take some Im so implications of that connection and sort of can you expand this to other parts of the government? I mean, you can within HHS itself, which is where I spend most of my time. I think there's plenty of opportunities between the Indian Health Service and, and NIH, and you can start talk about VA and NIH and CMS. When you kind of combine these things, you can imagine a place where you actually it can accelerate and probably you, you probably eliminate some of the some of the friction that exists in the in the system. Thank you, Bakul. And you know, um, you're raising this good point about part of what you know today is about is that in public sector health and public sector health care, um, it's a complex regulated system where a lot is at stake. And we have to be really intentional about thinking about these current applications, what's available, and how we can move forward together. Um, because it won't happen naturally, right? Because of the nature of the work. I mean, so you gave the CMS example. And so many times when I was in government, I was frustrated that there seems to be all of this data, but I can't actually turn that into a program and a policy that will impact the health of the individuals I was serving. So to really think intentionally today about how do we use these public-private partnerships to leverage that and bring the different cultures together in a way that can in intentionally impact health is uh, really important for us. And on that note, um, Seth, in your work on public-private partnerships, how do you leverage AI to improve healthcare decisions that are being made at the bedside? Yeah, so at the Surgical Critical Care Initiative at the Uniformed Services University, uh, we are by charter and by CRADA a public-private partnership. We have federal entities at, at the Uniformed Services University as well as Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center um, and the Naval Medical Research Center as some of our, our public partners, but we also have universities um, uh, that have been baked into our system uh, to help provide data and clinical biospecimens for the research that we do. So we have Duke University uh, as one of our enrollment sites, as well as Emory uh, University and Grady Memorial Hospital as another enrollment site. Uh, what we're trying to do is enroll patients that have been critically injured, uh, sometimes in very similar manners to combat casualties or combat casualties at Walter Reed, um, and uh, enroll them while they're in a surgical ICU, collect early data from these patients, collect early biospecimens from these patients, and be able to integrate the data that we're able to generate off of all of those biospecimens as well as the clinical data integrate it at all, introduce it to AIML, uh, use that AIML to generate good models that are predictive of the patient's trajectory. What we really want to know is, uh, is this patient that looks otherwise like they're, they're not that badly injured and they're young and healthy, and predict if they are actually going to develop serious complications of their injuries, like uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or, or acute kidney injury, if they're going to develop a pneumonia or sepsis, uh, if they're going to have complications to their extremity traumas and the like. Uh, what we have proposed and have been able to demonstrate through this public partnership, what we're able to do is we're able to uh, rely on novel in vitro diagnostic data um, from, uh, from those biospecimens that we're able to collect through this network and show where patients become dysregulated and are likely to be able to uh, develop those complications that we're trying to predict. We can then pair that, that no those novel data types with uh, the AI and develop clinical decision support tools that can help the clinicians in actually bending the curve and improving the patient care. Uh, while simultaneously we're lowering the cost of care for those patients by avoiding uh, some of the worst effects of those complications. I really appreciated your patient-focused um, examples and thinking about how we can use these powerful predictive tools to enhance the care we do as clinicians. Um, you know, oftentimes we think about AI, Gen AI, and what is the role 
compared to the humans. And here's a great example of the human is driving it and this is assisting in a powerful way to be able to um, improve the clinical outcomes. And um, Nick, talking about public-private partnerships, um, what about um, in biomedical research? How do we evolve to accelerate that um, in that area as well? Sure, yeah, so we, I'll think about it from like a macro level and a micro level. So at the macro level, we partner uh, with Google Cloud um, and other uh, commercial cloud companies. Um, and I say partner because it's not a standard government contract. We use something called other transaction authority, uh, and that enables us a lot of flexibility outside of federal acquisition regulations and other things that might you know, restrict um, how creative we can be and some of the things we might be able to do to explore and push the envelope in research. Um, so that partnership you know, enables us to do uh, collaborative uh, activities with uh, Google Cloud um, and others uh, with our researchers. So you'll hear a little later today, I believe, uh, about researchers from our National Cancer Institute and our National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that are collaborating actively with Google uh, to build um, de-identification capabilities for medical images. And that the goal there is to build that back into the foundational capabilities of Google's platform, its APIs, so that everyone um, you know, who's using those products and services can benefit from that capability. So those sort of collaborative R&D activities uh, in between you know, kind of the um, space of public-private with you know, NIH and Google is you know, set to benefit everyone and anyone who's going to use these uh, products and capabilities. So uh, that's an incredible um, you know, kind of example, I think, of uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, additionally, at the, um, you know, what I think of as at the micro level, uh, and this is getting down to individual students and trainees across the country, um, we've partnered with Google, our National uh, Institute of General Medical Sciences uh, has partnered with Google to build something called uh, the NIGMS, that's the, the um, acronym for what I just said, um, Sandbox. And this uh, runs through something we have called uh, the NIH Cloud Lab um, that allows people to come and use at no cost and, and in our you know, kind of NIH um, uh, environment with guardrails and uh, cost controls, uh, the, the cloud capabilities to try and test things out. And in partnership with Google, uh, we worked with uh, 12 institutions uh, in what are called IDEA states. This is an institutional development uh, award program that NIH and other agencies uh, participate in. And this is meant to fund uh, and support research in those states and areas across the country that are historically underrepresented and underfunded uh, in research. So um, many of the states in the middle of the country and, and you know, other parts uh, that don't get uh, the same amount of funding and support that the, the coasts get, right? Um, and so in this partnership, uh, we worked with you know, our staff and, and Google staff worked with um, investigators from uh, these institutions to build capabilities on how to do you know, kind of basic research, uh, data science, bioinformatics, um, you know, uh, other applied uh, capabilities and you know, sequencing um, analysis uh, to build these modules that uh, students come, trainees come, uh, and can learn and, and walk through and, and learn how to do this sort of analysis without having access to local computational power and capabilities that the large institutions all have and the smaller ones don't. So this is really a way to democratize, democratize and, and level the playing field for anyone with a good idea to be able to use these capabilities that exist in the cloud uh, to accelerate uh, their research. Um, so we're really excited to have those sort of partnerships and capabilities with Google really leaning in and doing a lot through our partnership uh, to you know, enable um, you know, these sorts of uh, organizations and um, you know, communities. And I think that goes a long way or will go a long way towards some of the health equity uh, questions because we're working with uh, HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities. And if we can kind of get the foundation of the next generation of folks who live and work in those areas, I think that can only help uh, in what we're you know, trying to do uh, in the health equity space uh, in the years to come. Thank you, Nick. Really appreciate your concrete examples. And you know, um, your first one about uh, finding creative avenues by which to do this work. If you think about our work in the public sector, oftentimes it's um, you know the regulations that we and the rules that we go by were created in a different era. And so, how do we find ways within that to creatively move forward in these areas of potential? And then the democratization of data and really thinking about health equity, which is um, at the core of the work that we do in the public sector to make those um, who need our services the most able to get them. Really appreciate those. Well, um, Gerardo, with all of these exciting examples, these use case examples, these potentials for the future, activity that's happening now. 
now. Um, what things do we need to get absolutely right? What should we worry about? What are the challenges with this AI work from your point of view and your where you sit at Arbor Age? Yeah, uh, thank you, Monica. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of, you know, technology considerations and uh, but apparently Nick uh, has that pretty well covered with Google and our partners. I'm not going to talk about that. Rather, I want to talk about, you know, more the more squishy, sticky topics. And there are three things that I would like to to cover today. One is I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about safety, then ethics, and then policy, right? So, so let's start with safety. That's the basic, right? You know, do no harm. And uh, Monica, you've done a lot of great work, you know, with vulnerable populations. And uh, think about what's happening today in the U.S. with the mental, mental health crisis, right? Some people estimate that there's 50 million folks in the U.S. today that are in need of mental health, and half of them have access to care. And uh, there's many challenges. You know, you have a shortage of healthcare providers. You have reimbursement issues. You have, you know, huge stigma, right? You know, of living with a mental health condition. So, so what's happening is, not surprisingly, people are flocking by the millions to chatbots, AI chatbots, right? And uh, some of them are, you know, produced by well-intentioned folks. Others are released by technology companies. And the question is, are these things safe to use, right? You know, what is one of these chatbots going to do when? when they encounter some critical language that, you know, is hinting at somebody harming themselves or harming others, or will this chatbot condone, you know, substance or alcohol abuse, right? Uh, will this chatbot start providing medical advice, that, you know, maybe stuff that the chatbot is making up, right? So, so is it safe? And the, the answer is, you know, it varies greatly, right? Because all of these things, you know, given some loopholes that we have in, in legislation today, many digital health applications don't need to go through, you know, all of the rigorous testing that we expect for medical devices or, or drugs, right? So it's really on us, healthcare technology leaders, to think about safety by design, right? And make sure that we incorporate that in whatever it is that we do, even though we all have the pressure to launch the next big thing very, very quickly. So, you know, as, as you start asking yourself these questions, you move very quickly into, into the broader ethics conversation, right? And, the, and I think that there's, there's a huge difference, there should be a huge difference between the things that we can do and the things that we should do. For example, if we could use AI to eradicate all of the undesirable traits, you know, of the human genome, should we do it? How, how exactly do you go about saying what, what's non-desirable? By the way, what makes you believe that you have the right to do that, right? And, and what does that look like from, from a diversity perspective, from an access perspective? Are you going to be removing choice? Uh, so, so there's all kinds of difficult questions that are really sticky. And, uh, you know, you can't, this is not one where I would advise to go to your neighbor and ask them how you feel about these kinds of things. Maybe you want to think about it and reflect uh, so you identify how you feel about it, right? And, and to be clear, I'm, I'm not advocating for one particular philosophy, but what I'm advocating for is self-reflection, make sure that we understand our values and principles so we are purposeful when we make decisions. And, and from there, you, ver you go very quickly to, okay, so say that everyone wants to be ethical, but you know, most likely, you know, we're humans, we have different points of view, there will be disagreements on what is right and what is wrong, right? And then how do you guide the general population on, on the boundaries of what's acceptable? And this is where legislation comes into practice, right? It's really, really important that we get the right legislation because, you know, the wrong le le legislation or the absence of it will matter. And the, then the question is, how do you adopt agile frameworks to help legislators move at the speed of innovation, right? Which is it's a challenge. I mean, there's there's a reason why legislation takes time today because you know you want to make it, you want to get it right, you want to get you know multiple points of view right, you want to make it safe, but uh, how do we make that faster? And again, you know, there's there's a lot of activity on this field for those of you that are following what's going on. Lots of activity on this field. It's not that people are just sitting there, uh, but you know the conversation is happening. I think it's important that we all 
are part of the conversation because where we land is going to matter. So those are three. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think, you know, you bring up this important point that in health, right, we have an extra um, requirement to think about safety, security, privacy um, in a way that is even beyond just when you're thinking about AI in general. And, you know, I know a lot guardrails are really important. For example, we have AI principles that we look at when we produce any product to see is it aligning with that along some of the issues that you raised. Um, Seth, when you think about, you know, we're talking about the challenges a little bit of being able to do this work. When you think about integrating multimodal data into both your research and operational examples you gave. Um, how do you think about that in the setting of healthcare and DOD in your work? Yeah, so for me, um, the SE2I and many of these public-private partnerships, one, we're, we're all resource constrained, so we need to do more with less. Uh, if I broke down uh, the nature of our research into two components, either basic translational or clinically focused, um, we we require a lot in terms of um, existing infrastructure and standards. So, uh, you know, where we don't have to invent the standard, that is going to be of an advantage to us if we can use uh, existing clinical models for data, if we can use existing models for multi-omics, multi multimodal data types, um, that is going to be an advantage to us. Um, you know, we also need good design patterns for our research infrastructure as well as anything that we want to translate into a clinical tool. How do we get that, um, how do we integrate all of the different types of data that uh, may be presented to an AI model uh, in an efficient way that is compliant with regulations or security? Uh, requirements uh, and then integrate it to where the clinicians work. Uh, we're often thinking about the, the, the clinical workflows in which the decisions are being made that our tools are trying to target. So that's also a very big challenge. How do we get the information to the clinician at the right time so they can make the right decision uh, for the care of their patient? So all of these things are where um, better and more thought out uh, uh, data infrastructure can help us tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I mean, here we are this morning. We're talking about innovation, equity, improving health, um, and really these concrete applications that we've heard about from our panelists, as well as the art of the possible. And, you know, in that art of the possible, um, we can't leave without talking about Gen AI. And um, Bakul, I'm going to give you the um, last question. Um, when we think about Gen AI and AI and how it will revolutionize our work, how might some of these innovations be useful to our colleagues? in the federal setting, um, as you've heard about some of the work that they're doing here today. Thank you, Bolinga. This is my favorite topic. I can brainstorm till the cows come home, so probably yeah, speaking. Minutes. You have three minutes. I know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's too short. Um, I, I know I'm listening to this conversation. I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, there's so much cross-learning to be had um, from processes to sharing to application space. I mean, everything that Nick and Gerardo, you said, and you know, coupled with what you just said, Seth, it's it's standardization that sort of matters. But I think with AI and Gen AI, I think you, you're you just taking the possibilities to the next level. So uh, I will break this down into two parts, like the one, the predictive AI that the world we know of today, and then the Gen AI world. So the predictive AI world, I think you can do lots with that already. You know, smart searching, smart insights, you know, smart presentation of of day of information to the user. I think we talked about those general common, general sort of themes that we could do today. I mean, we are getting better at it. Simple things like de-identifying, like you were just talking about, but also labeling data uh, could be a really easy thing that's actually multiplying, has a multiplying effect on, on how others can sort of take that to the next level. So Google has all these tools uh, already available for folks to just take and launch from there. I think what's missing is the societal factor or, or the organizational factors that getting getting people to sort of take the addict advantage of that and take it to the next level. I think Nick, you just mentioned you have programs to sort of do that. I feel like that could be helpful. 
Talking about Gen AI, which is the most exciting thing in the last 18 months that's happening to all of us with us, is is an important factor to sort of consider. I mean, with with Gen AI, you you know, um, there's lots of lots of excitement. At the same time, there's lots of sort of caution as well that's going on in the space. I think we need to be right in the middle. I would say. I think, for example, I mean, MetaLM can do a really good job of summarization, but we have to have somebody along with it to make sure the summarization is done in the way that the person seeks to sort of do. Um, creating a patient-facing um, summary note or discharge summary is a really great start for us to start thinking about it, and that takes away so much friction into the, into the care system. But if you start taking that next step forward, and I don't know who said it, but you you guys are looking at workspace to be combined with Gen AI. Beautiful. I mean, we use some of these tools internally where it can start summarizing, oh, this is what the the discussion has been going on in your in your chat. That's phenomenal. I don't trust it all because it's not always right. But so I have to go read it. But it actually gives me a head start into what the main points of the conversation. I think using Gen AI smartly and getting people to start building trust in this is going to be helpful. I'll be remiss to not say this word called prompt engineering. We talked about that before. I think that's in space we all need to invest more because it's just, you know, it, Gen AI is a tool. It's going to answer what you ask it. If you answer, if you ask some questions that's not so, so pointed, you'll get some unpointed answers back. Which is which is also a challenge, but I think this is kind of a place that we can all involve over time, having good structural um, spaces, um, boundaries around like what should what good looks like in the prompting things. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday, so I'm just going to digress for just one second. I was with a couple of folks, and and um, they were they were talking about oh, but Gen AI hallucinates. I said yes, you can tell it not to. And it won't. And I think that's the key thing is like what you ask it, if you tell it like don't hallucinate, give me factual things in the beginning of your prompt, you actually can get better answers. So there is a way around this and that's the art of the possible. Thank you, Bakul. Um, well, I could go on asking this group um, of panelists questions all day, but we have an exciting program ahead of us. Um, thank you all so much. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. I'm looking forward to talking with you too. Well, I am inspired to know this panel both professionally and personally. Uh, thank you all. That was wonderful and great use of the use cases uh, and examples. I'd like to introduce our next presentation. So revolutionizing federal health care with Google Gemini. So I'm going to welcome two rock star Google Cloud customer engineers, Giovanni Marchetti and Rajat Gupta. Hello, everyone. OK, I'm a Google person. I have to use Zoom, so bear with me. Go. Okay, do you see my face? Yes. Okay, I am ready to go, but the slides are not moving. Yeah, they are moving over there, but not over here. The slides are moving on just some of the screens. I don't know why. Well, in the interest of time, I'll uh, get started with introductions. I'm Giovanni. I'm a machine learning engineer based out of the Google Seattle office. I've been working on machine learning basically for the past 23 years since I got a degree in machine learning when it was not popular. They called it intelligent systems at the time. 
and um, they advised me that I wouldn't have. It's uh, it's shared. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's working out good. So um, I'd like just to um, start with some definitions so that we're all on the same playing field, basically. We hear a lot about generative machine learning, generative AI, generative this, generative that. What does it generate in the first place? Well, a generative model is any machine learning model that generates video, audio, um, text, language, code, etc. They've been around for a while. They've become popular right now, but they've been around for a while. Uh, for instance, one of the earliest models is used very successfully to do anomaly detection in the healthcare field, in the um, geospatial intelligence field. There are a lot of those um, around that have been specialized for these use cases. Right now, Large language models, which are a type of generative model, have become very popular. It's a generative model that understands and generates human language. We call it large because it's larger than the previous ones. It's larger in terms of its structure. It's larger in terms of its data sets. It can also be used for non-generative tasks. So you can use it to classify text, for instance, or classify pictures if you're using multimodal models. Um, you hear very often that these models are associated with a concept of a transformer. It's a transformer-based, large language model, state-of-the-art this and state-of-the-art that. Transformer is the underlying neural network architecture that underpins a lot of these models. It was introduced by Google in 2017 in a seminal paper, um, and it was originally designed to do translation, so it would encode text in a language and decode it in another language. And that's where the concept of a encoder, decoder, transformer comes up, or a decoder only transformer when you're using only one language, for instance, English, um, comes up. Now that we have these definitions, let's have a look at a difference in machine learning and traditional programming language as they used to be and in the generative world. In traditional programming, if you wanted to classify something, you had to define it first. If you wanted to uh, classify a cat, for instance, you would give it an explicit definition. It's an animal, it's got four legs, etc. In predictive machine learning, which is something that we've been doing for a number of years now, uh, um, the fundamental technology was invented for it in 1986. Um, you provide samples of what you want the neural network to predict, such as this is a cat, this is a dog, etc., and you let the network learn the rule from the sample, and then it will give you a classification. The problem with that is you need to provide a lot of samples for it to have discriminatory power, and um, you also have networks that are good at one task at one task only. A stupid example, I train a network to define um, you know, and recognize cats and dogs. Now I show it a picture of an elephant. It'll tell you it's either a cat or a dog. Now, to solve that problem, we come up with generative language models, such as Palm, Lambda, our arch nemesis, GPT, and uh, now Google's Gemini. Um, the idea is we give these models the whole body of human knowledge. And then we ask them questions that refine and expand that knowledge that they're built upon. It's like basically educating a child. You teach them to read, then you teach them to read a book, and then you ask them questions about what's in the book, and then you ask them to infer further information from the um, data that they've accumulated in reading the book. So in this case, for instance, it would be like giving the all neural networks, the whole of the Encyclopedia Britannica to read, and then you ask it, what's a cat? And it'll come up with a definition. What's the challenge with that? These models are trained to generate. They are stochastic, not deterministic. Also, the previous models, the predictive machine learning models, are stochastic. But there are ways to contain the range of outputs that they give. In this generative world, 
the models can hallucinate because they're trained to generate text, and that's the only thing they understand. You give them an unclear prompt, they will give you a useless answer. That's what my wife says about me, by the way. <laughs> so what's the great innovation that uh, um, Gemini has introduced right now? Google has introduced, actually, uh, with this model Gemini. So far, most of the models were limited to processing text. Now we are entering the era of the multimodal models. Multimodal means models that can reason on a variety of information, images, videos, sounds, and text in the case of, of Gemini. The innovation in here is that each one of these modalities is treated as text. So it is in jargon tokenized as language are. And uh, then the reasoning stack of the neural network treats those tokens all together. Well, the video, the picture, the language, etc., And it will produce an output in any of these four modalities. Right now, what I'm going to show you is one of those modalities in output, text. That's what we turned on. There has been some controversy about the image generation recently in the press, so we turned it off temporarily as we sort that out. But the model itself gets four modalities in, reasons on all of them together, and produces four types of outputs. Right now, as I said, we are looking at this idea of tokens um, as input. Now, um, and as I mentioned, images are also con sorry, considered tokens. To give you an idea, in the English language, there are about four tokens every three words. In Spanish, Italian, French, they are more information dense, so there are about two tokens for every word. And I mention this because a lot of you have to deal with multilingual audiences and therefore um, have to have an idea of what this token means. When we considering images for the Gemini model, and you upload an image, like for instance, this one here of an X-ray, you'll see that the image takes away about 256 tokens by design. A video will take more, depending on how long it is. So as you create an input in terms of words, you consume a number of tokens. And as you add images to the input, you consume another number of tokens. This whole uh, set of tokens that you provide as input is known as context. That is what the model operates on when you go ask it a question. Now, that's both the beauty and the limitation of the model. It can keep context, but the context itself is limited in this particular case to 12,000 and something tokens for multimodal, 32,000 for text only. For the Gemini 1.0 Pro, Now that you provided this context, the model can infer information from this context. And in this particular case, it's leveraging its training data. It's leveraging the encyclopedia that it's read to try and describe this image. Before I click run, I must say the usual caveats. This is not FDA approved. It's not meant to be your doctor. And it's not even specialized on medical data. This is the model that you can experiment with with a free tool out of the box. Even so, in its basic format, it does give some pretty interesting answers. It takes a little while, you know, a few seconds to process as we're sending the data to a frozen version of this model that runs on the Google Cloud. We're not retaining your data. We're then returning the answer and deleting the context. So one run carries its own context, that's it. So in this particular case, I'm no doctor, so I've had a doctor actually consult with me uh, before the demo. And uh, um, the description of the image is factually correct. It may not be as good as a radiologist would give you, but it is factually correct. Now, I have no idea of what an effusion is, so I'm going to go ask it. So what I'm doing is I am 
using the original input and the information that has been provided to add to the context. And I'm doing another level of reasoning, so further logical inference. And I'm going to ask, what is an effusion? So it does a second level of inferencing based on the context information that you provided. And it gives me a definition of what an effusion is. Now, here's where providing factual and uh, precise questions becomes important. So for the model to be factual and remain factual, I reduce its creativity, also known as the temperature, to zero. And I also ask specifically how it would treat this particular effusion without carrying any other context. So you do not have information on the cause of this effusion, which basically instructs the model to forget everything it has learned about causes of effusion how would you treat it? There you go. So it actually asks you and directs you to find the cause of the effusion in the first place. You can use this is a tool to inform your decisions in a clinical settings or as a tool to perform research. You can also use it to do comparative reasoning or what is called differential reasoning. What if I don't know anything and I'm not a doctor, I don't know anything. I'm shown an x-ray of a healthy person and an x-ray of a sick person. How would I know the difference? Can a model actually explain that to me? based on the knowledge it has already acquired. And this is what the next prompt is about. We don't need to save this. So I've run it and saved it just to save a bit of time. Uh, the um, picture on the left is that of a healthy person. The picture on the right is that of a person with pneumonia, according to um, the radiology masterclass at the University College London. So. I've citing my sources here, and I'm asking the model to describe why that is and explain the differences. And so it does, actually. It also tells me that um, um, the um, x-ray on the left is clear, and that's why and how you can actually figure that out, that the person is healthy or not. This gives you an example of how the model can infer information not only from one source, but also from the difference between multiple sources. That carries a semantic value. I want to conclude with one further consideration. I mentioned that um, the limitation is in the context size. So if I was to turn off one of the modalities and only use text, I could actually exploit more of that context and uh, um, have it perform further symbolic processing, so further logical reasoning on the symbols that we call a language. And that's what I've done in uh, this particular case. Let's have a look at this one in a chat context. The idea is to help somebody like me who does not know anything about emergency medical procedures. And I have an assistant that on the other hand has ingested all the emergency medical handbook produced by University of Ottawa for its emergency management department. It's read it all, it's not huge, it's about 26,000 tokens. Now, um, as a lay person, I have a patient with chest pain, excessive sweating, and pain radiating to the left arm. I mean, we know from watching too much uh, ER and Gray's Anatomy, that's a person with um, a probable heart attack. 
But I want to know a way to, fi uh, to figure that out. How do I actually make sure that this person has a heart attack and how am I going to treat it? So the model here is reading the book and coming up with a set of steps, risk factors, examinations and investigations to carry out, and management techniques. Now, the model itself, as I said, is not medically trained. I have provided information, additional information that it can reason upon and combine with the information it's been trained on, which does contain some medical uh, stuff, to uh, come up with a set of questions to end procedures. So to uh, direct me on how to augment its knowledge so that it, we can then for um, therefore act upon the condition that's been explained. Now to extend that, we can use a bigger model that has a much larger context, which is this one, the one that we've uh, recently announced as of, I think, 10 days ago, called 1.5 Pro. It has a million tokens, a million and something tokens that it can uh, reason upon. So how about we go and have it ingest all of the Grace Anatomy manual. That's about, actually, that's exactly 997,528 tokens. It's almost filling the whole context space. And this is an old edition, by the way. The newest edition actually is bigger than that. It doesn't fit in the context space. And at that point, I can ask the model to use only the information provided. So only use the grounding data that are provided and provide me a summary of something. And in this particular case, I wanted to describe the structure of the lining of the stomach, both macroscopic and microscopic. Now, note that I haven't specified it. So the model has inferred that I want to know about both macroscopic and microscopic. It's gone and found the right chapter in this 700 plus pages book, summarized it and presented it to me in bullet points so that a layperson can understand. So as you can see, we have just out of the box an enormous amount of capabilities that you can start developing on um, simply using what is called as prompt engineering. I haven't developed any code for this. I just try to prompt the model to give the answers in the context and with the level of accuracy that I was looking for. If you go and uh, play with it, you will find out, for instance, that the model is also able to tell you, no, I don't know, which is another great thing to keep in mind. Um, one way to stop hallucination and therefore possibly dangerous answers in a clinical context is to have the model admit that the knowledge is not there. And this is what uh, the Gemini models are also trained to do. They hallucinate, yes, but they hallucinate far less often than the previous iterations, and they are able to tell you when you need to stop. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Rajat, who will uh, carry on on this uh, interesting thread. Thank you. Sorry, I just closed my presentation. Everyone, my name is Rajat Gupta. Uh, I'm a customer engineer here at Google Cloud. It's really difficult to go after Giovanni. Uh, we were preparing for the demo, and he can, comes up one day, and he's like, I'm going to do the picture of this x-ray, and then, uh, and then I'm going to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do 10 pictures. 
and then I will go after her, and then people will like me more. <laughs> then he comes up and says, you know what, uh, I'm going to throw this whole book at it and try to get answers out of that, and uh, then I'm cooler than you. And I'm thinking there, and then we don't talk for a couple of days, and I'm like, what can I do here? Right, like he is so unpredictable. Don't get fooled by how he looks and everything. <laughs> so what I wanted to do and show you today is I'm like, I'm gonna go for the moon. The moon is PubMed website. I'm gonna go and index that whole website and let me see if he can come up with a better solution than that. Uh, once I started looking at the PubMed website, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a small, small website. Uh, it was not. And so I started going down the path of like, what do I need to do? I need to collect all the pages that are there. I need to parse those pages using some utility. I need to chunk those pages. Then I need to embed, get some embedding out of those pages there. And then I need to store them somewhere. Why are we doing that? Giovanni mentioned that the LLMs today, as they are getting bigger and bigger in, con in terms of the context windows, you still cannot throw a PubMed website at them. You can throw one book. Maybe you will throw a couple of books there. You cannot throw 10 books, 100 books today at a LLM and say, give me an answer. So you still have to start with a search engine. You still have to start with collecting. You still have to start with parsing, chunking, embedding, storing. And then after that, you have to figure out how to query it, how to host it, how to do summarizations and everything else on top of it. I'm like, awesome, this looks good. The demo is next week. So I'm like, is there a better way to do this thing? There's a product called Vertex AI Search. I went ahead, used that product. Uh, I said, hey, go to pubmed.gov. I want to index that particular website. Uh, can you do that? And I gave it the link, went for a really long lunch. There's my management in the room here. Um, and then I came back and the whole website was indexed. What got indexed? Millions of pages. They were chunked, they were parsed, uh, embeddings were created behind the scenes. Uh, they were stored, there was an index created on top of it, and it was ready for me to query, right? That is the power of what Google can bring to the table on day one. Right. Let's see how that looks like. I'm going to try to show another tab here. So uh, I think one of the panelists was talking about what if people came to PubMed and just started asking questions. Give me something. I, I'm having this problem. I want to go and get some initial answers out of the website there. So this is a very generic question, what are the early warning signs of high blood pressure and what lifestyle changes can help control it? Uh, on the top, you can see that we have a summary that is coming from MedLM or MedPalm uh, line of our models. And then at the bottom, we do have the summary of, uh, from Gemini 2. As you will see, there is not a lot of difference between Gemini and MedPalm. MedPalm is going to be, or the uh, family of MedPalm models is going to be much more contextual, it is fine-tuned for specific medical information. So all I had to do is point to my particular index over there, uh, get the blue links and uh, the extractive text out of there, then call Gemini and MedPalm and say, summarize this information that's coming in. What that gives you is basically starting to do that on day one. Your answers are grounded in these links that are coming from the PubMed website, you can see which links are coming in. You can see which paragraph or which text did we take to come up with that summary over there. So the hallucinations point and the grounding point is very, very important. This will help you see where the answers are there, right? Take an example, another example of this. Can't handle my mouse there. Another example can be what are the important factors to consider when choosing a medication for allergies, uh, such as antihistamines. And then again, similar stuff as we run this query here, we should be able to come in and get the results from PubMed. Uh, any of those millions of pages over there, we should be able to query that within seconds, 
get this answer, summarize it using the different models that are available, and you get an engine that is grounded in factuality, grounded in your particular uh, data set there. Uh, what is the difference? There are two differences. If, you, if there are two things that you want to take away from here, first is indexed PubMed, Medline Plus, clinicaltrials.gov, all these big websites, you can index it on day one. You can start putting the RAG layer on top of it on day one. You don't have to maintain those indexes. Every day, these websites are living and breathing. If you add more pages, Google takes care of the re-indexing uh, of the websites there. And on top of that, the MedPalm, MedLM models that you can put on top, that will allow you to give contextual tuned information and the summarization there. So those are the two main key takeaways from this particular, uh, this particular demo here. I'm gonna go back quickly to my slides. So coming back, we saw that you know we, we didn't have to do all the parsing, chunking, embedding, indexing, storage. Uh, we didn't have to have a full, huge uh, team of developers that are just trying to do the stuff that is not interesting, right? You want to be doing the prompt engineering. You want to be prompting the model to try to figure out how to get good contextual answers. You want to be creating chat applications on top of it. You don't want to spend your time indexing a website. You don't want your time running those data pipelines that is still 80% of what the machine learning workloads are today. So this, by this way, you can start from day one. You get an index website to start with. Start with day one here. Uh, you get a Google quality search engine. In this particular case, PubMed, we have been indexing PubMed for the last 15 to 20 years. We know how that works. We are able to take that index and bring it in your environment so that you can use the same uh, index on day one. Again, re-indexing, it's handled by Google. There is a full API uh, support that is available to do something like this, and the results are grounded in your data, in your links, in your extractive segments, and in your text. I want to make sure that we are not just looking at the links, we are just not looking at the, ext the extracts that come with those links, we are actually looking at your PDFs, and we are OCRing those PDFs, and if the information is embedded in page 234 of a 600 page document, we'll be able to bring that back and share that with you. Also another point, the, the uh, demo that you saw, uh, that was kind of a zero shot. We just asked a question, we got the result back. If you want the tone of the uh, model to be different, more empathetic, or more factual, you should be able to tune what I, what I showed you today. But those answers came out vanilla from the Gemini model or from the Medellin model, model there. Right? Uh, again, the whole thing is extensible. You start with what I showed. But then if you want to bring your own embeddings, you want to do your own customizations, uh, you want to do your own chunking over there, uh, you should be able to do all of that. The example that I showed was more on your external facing website. Same example, we are working with multiple customers, which is more internal facing. If you have internal documents that are uh, very contextualized to what you are doing, we should be able to put a similar search engine on top of it, get you enabled on day one to start querying and uh, summarizing there. Uh, that was my quick model. I'm getting uh, looks from the back of the room. So if there are any questions, please let me know. We'll be around to answer them. Thank you. We do have a couple time, a couple of minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, we have one. Uh, Giovanni, what, what is limiting the tokens right now? Is it just for the randomness of the model, or is it the server capacity? Why is there a limit, you know, and how, how quickly are we going to break through those limits? Most of the limits are due to computational costs. So the structure themselves can be extended, and uh, um, they can basically be replicated to handle more tokens. But the more tokens and in input, the higher the processing cost will be. And uh, that's both for us to bear when we serve out the model and for you to pay when um, you consume it.
Hello, Chen Li Ding from Celerance. I have a question. What is Google doing to make sure the results produced are unbiased? So let's say from PubMed, you have lots of documents, right? And some studies may have uh, different opinions or uh, results. And how do you make sure the summary present a complete picture of different studies? Okay. So how do we make sure that the models are unbiased? In general, when we train a model or when you know, our competitors also train a model, it's an industry-wide approach, there are two ways of uh, making sure that um, we make the models unbiased, as unbiased as they can possibly be. The first one is to curate the data set. And that's why both Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, etc., are very jealous of their training data sets. We don't publish them um, back into the open source because we spend a lot of time trying to filter out dangers, biased, or um, other uh, potentially um, incorrect information before we even start training the model. And uh, the size of this data set is enormous. Um, it takes about a trillion tokens to train one iteration of this large language model. So the, the cost of putting them together and curating them is also uh, enormous. The other technique that is used is in iterative training of these models, there is a step called reinforcement learning with human feedback, where we have humans actually go review the answers and provide uh, feedback to the model. This is incorrect or this is biased or this is because of this reason with alternative curated answers. The next step, the model is in jargon punished. A, its gain function is reduced when um, the next iteration happens. So therefore the model learns by itself to filter out the biased or incorrect or dangerous information. There is a third step where we actually censor the model, both in input and in output. I haven't shown it, but in the interface, there is a little um, safety setting where you can basically select uh, the level of danger that you're prepared to tolerate, if you want, in the answer that are produced. Uh, you cannot turn them off. Um, there are three or four, no, there's actually five levels that um, uh, you can set up. And that's to censor the answer coming out. There is another model that evaluates the answers that are being produced on the basis of various risk factors. And in the case the threshold is um, surpassed, it will just give you a blank answer and highlight that you've hit one of those thresholds. The same thing happens in input. And that separate model is actually an open source offering. It's called the, no, it's not an open source offering. It's a free offering for everybody to use by uh, one of the Google subsidiaries called the Perspective API, anyone can consume it. So you can basically test your own inputs and outputs um, before you query the models. Yeah, hi, this is Hemant Bundele from Avalanche Company. Between two demos, it's hard to say who is the winner here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would still go with the Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just because I understood that more than I think uh, <laughs> what you had uh, shown Rajat, but I do have a question for Rajat though, that once you index, let's say this external website, right, all this wonderful, you know, index which Google already has and now it is in my environment, but I also have a local data set which I don't want to be exposed to the public, but I want to use that in the, you know, in my Q&A or whatnot. So how do I protect that? I know there are, you know, I don't want it to go out of the perimeter at all. So is there a way to? This is the first time we are hearing that requirement for protection. I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the question is that uh, once I have an external website and I've indexed it, how do I protect my information from going out or external information from getting in? So what I did basically was copy the index that's outside and bring it into your GCP environment. You have a copy of external websites index running in your environment. You have full control over it. You want to add pages on the fly. You want to take some pages out on the fly. You can do that. Uh, there are other controls which can help with the bias question that you were asking. If you want to boost certain results, uh, bury certain results because you think that people are trying to game the system, you have those controls over there also. Uh, again, the data is in your environment, so it doesn't go out. We don't see 
uh, the uh, the uh, interaction that you have with that particular data. We are just looking at the API calls, how much query and how much storage you are using there. Uh, in addition, if you have uh, internal data sets, if you have data sets that are sitting in like ServiceNow or Salesforce, uh, SharePoint, Google Drive, and everything else, you should be able to take all that those data sets and blend them into the external website data set that I showed. So your internal search can be super robust over there where you come in and you can ask a question. You should be able to ask the question from any of the data sets that you have full control over, external website being one of them. I'll do better next time with, with the stuff here, I promise. <laughs> Thank you, Giovanni and Rajat. Excellent. Now everybody needs to get on their, their laptops and start playing with Gemini. All right, we have one more presentation before lunch um, about improving healthcare outcomes with explainable AI. I'd like to welcome Vivian Neely, who is our product manager for Google Cloud Healthcare, and Ron Rucka from Onyx, who is the director for healthcare and life sciences at Onyx. Thanks. Thank you. Being five feet tall always makes these. Oh, is there? There we go. Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Vivian Neely. I am the lead product manager of the healthcare APIs at Google Cloud. So, uh, between uh, a lot of the standardization, data standardization that's happening in structured data as well as um, our medical imaging suite. So kind of overseeing fire, DICOM, as well as a lot of the differences between um, our how we're working with standards bodies and how we're ensuring that things like the tech representation is actually coming back into um, legislation. So a lot of my work actually is thinking through things like how can we incorporate US CDI elements into US core within FHIR. So um, I'm kind of here to talk today a lot about how we're thinking about explainable AI at Google and how this can be um, ha and should be used to kind of further the outcomes and kind of make the trust in the system much more robust than what we have maybe seen previously. And so when we talk a lot to our kind of customers and a lot of the industry that's kind of the direction that we're going, we've always known we have a healthcare problem. We've always known we're very sick. We've also known that the healthcare data problem probably has a lot of solutions that can be mined or perhaps um, inferences that can be mined out of the data to improve these outcomes. But not only have we been historically perhaps bad at doing this because of things like interoperability issues, but we also are potentially having a data explosion problem between all of the large medical imaging uh, solutions that are coming out, including things like including pathology slides and part of uh, patient record, and as, as well as their whole lifetime of data. Um, the the world that we see is kind of even you know making it worse with genomics and things like that. And so um, we think that there are insights to be had in the data, but. The data is also getting bigger as we're trying to mine those insights. And so one of the things that I think a lot of what you've heard today is the amazing thing about generative AI is it can take huge corpuses, especially with the new Gemini 1.5, which is a really kind of extremely expanding the amount of tokenization that we can, we can support and the amount of data that you can support. Um, and, and taking large amounts of data and actually mining it and answering, asking questions of that, of that data. And so um, one of the things that kind of is a barrier for all of the impressive outcomes that you heard this morning and a lot of the use of, the, uh, of some of the tools that we see is the common questions and some of the questions I've even heard today are, how do we trust the system? How do we know the system is ethical? How do we know the system is accurate? And so one of the things that um, I'm excited to talk about are there's kind of a lot of tools in the explainability and responsible AI um, that we're, we're kind of working on. And so when I think about where we are in the world of bringing insights into the data, 
We, the interoperability of the United States has significantly improved since a lot of the legislation, blue button, things like that have actually started to be enforced. And now, you know, TEFCA is actually kind of coming to fruition. And so we're seeing the ability to create a longitudinal health record um, really come to fruition where the medical data is being better shared. And while there's plenty of work that can continue to go on, we tend to see our customers level of uh, what I consider the maturity model of a longitudinal record is we're pretty good now at co-locating and, and, and getting much, much better at this syntactic harmonization, semantic harmonization, and getting the structured data together to be able to be queried. We're, we're actually, I would say a lot of customers are either there or working to become much more uh, mature in that sense. And this opens up now, we are just moving into the next steps of the maturity model, which is how do I enrich and machine curate the data? So this is a good example where free text, how do I mine free text where perhaps those insights about a condition don't exist in the structured data, but didn't exist in free text and can enrich the structured data. I'm not creating anything new. I'm actually just adding data that maybe wasn't available to me or easily before. And then the second one, which is this is where some of the generative AI capabilities are coming about, is actually tell me something new about this patient. Read trends and understand things about the data and how we might be able to infer new things. This is kind of predict the risk of a patient. And so this is a really interesting space because as we go forward, we need to think about how to do this very responsibly and ethically. And that's, I think, where a lot of the work that, that we're thinking through now, I'm part of the cloud AI organization, comes in. One of the things that's amazing at Google um, is every time as a product manager, I want to create and relaunch a product, I actually have to go through the responsible AI ethical board to make sure that we are thinking through, you know, and, and you can imagine it's, you just get grilled with questions that you haven't even thought about in terms of how we are launching these things and how we're making it more responsible. But the, the biggest reason for that is because what we find is the less trustworthy a system is, the less likely it is to be adopted. So it's not just important for society, important for our ethical kind of, so I can sleep at night. It is also so that we can make sure these tools can get adopted because healthcare tends to be the most risk adverse of any of the customers that we see at Cloud AI. And so, you know, when you think about a lot of the organizations we work with, we live in a peer-reviewed society. And, and now we're introducing a, you know, a generative that, you know, we, we could not peer review a, uh, a, a, a release a paper on all the things all, that it's pulling from. As we talked about, a lot of this is kind of creating information based on context. And so um, that's a new world for the scientific population. And one of the things that we think about when looking at kind of the opportunities um, and, and, and uh, talking through what's high, you know, what can be easily low hanging fruit, low risk, and might have good opportunity. I always joke, I say this is something like solving the parking lot problem at a hospital. But then we kind of walk very far into also how can we do things like predictive uh, analysis on pathology slides. And so this is where we need to think through, since we're in such a conservative industry, we are thinking through, well, then what does it mean to make sure that we're building this in a way that can be, can be utilized and trusted? And there's a bunch of polls that have shown this, but moral of the story is that actually trust in the system tends to be the biggest barrier to adoption. And we are thinking through, and there should be standardization here on what that actually means and looks like. And so when I say trustworthy AI, that actually means a few different things. Um, now, I will caveat this with these are my definitions, and um, there are plenty of different definitions, and they're uh, depending on who you ask. And so I tend to boil them down to these four, uh, but there are a plethora of ways to describe kind of responsible AI and trustworthy AI. But I tend to think about it when we talk through the model lifecycle. The first thing you need to do is 
be think through the responsibility factor of this. This is asking yourself, what impact does it have to society? Understand this and all of the ways that this could go wrong. Um, my most fun job of a product manager is spending time to figure out how someone's going to use your product and all and exactly how you don't want them to and exactly what it's not built for and kind of building for, making sure that we're building for that and caveating for it. There's the ethical AI, which is working through the mitigation, you know, the equity of the model, mitigating bias, making sure that you're using comprehensive, um, if you're not using kind of comprehensive population data sets, making sure that you're well documenting that. Here are the caveats. This, this was a model that was built and trained with mostly men. That's extremely important for someone to know when they're using it on a female population. There's the transparent AI, which takes the, the ethical aspects of, of building models and actually brings it into um, what the model is meant to do. Um, and so the, the transparent AI is making sure that your model's well documented. I kind of talk talking through ethical AI and transparent AI. There's what we call data cards and there's model cards. Um, if no one has heard of them, they're great assets that Google Google has open sourced and actually walk through. Here's the recommendations on all the metadata you should have when trying to build transparent data sets and transparent models. The final one is the explainability factor. So this is, once you have an inference, how do I know the confidence score? How do I know why it actually came to that conclusion and what data it's drawing upon to make that inference? And this is kind of explainability aspects. And so that really kind of actually boils down to, as I talked about, asking yourself questions throughout the model lifecycle. So from starting to think about a product starting to actually build that product and actually then utilizing and operationalizing that model. And so um, there's kind of a, a suite of things that need to be thought about and different questions that need to be asked throughout the life cycle of the model. Now, one of the things I think that we are seeing and we're super excited about, um, kudos to the, if there's anyone from the ONC here, uh, earlier today during the, um, the great session we had this morning, and they said, well, legislation uh, tends to uh, be slower. You know, we have to kind of think through how we can uh, increase the speed of which legislation is happening. But um, actually, HTI-1, for those who haven't read the 500 pages like I did on a Saturday, um, has great, now that it's published, actually has a great additions to USCDI on what transparency in AI algorithms mean. Um, and it changed, you know, what we considered clinical decision support to decision support interventions. And there's a lot of work that's gone into thinking about what are the metadata elements that should be included. This, as the uh, lead of the inter interoperability platform, this is super exciting because one of the things that with AI transparency, explainability, that we were worried about is, okay, so you can say a confidence interval, but what if every time it's given, it's somewhere different in a data set? An application doesn't know where to find it. An application can't actually, um, you know, it's the wild west in terms of people, how people are reporting this. And so the uh, legislation actually goes a long way to make sure that these are portable assets, that the, the responsibility factors of this can be shown in the same way in the same time and actually kind of cross boundaries and be, you know, as they should, interoperable. And so um, one of the case studies I'd love to talk about, uh, we actually did, and, and early in my career, I'd, one of the first research projects I did was um, the kind of prediction on bedtime utilization and, and pre- and post-op care. And one of the hardest things when thinking about surgical optimization is the length of time of a surgery. Um, actually knowing how long that patient is going to be in that surgical bed is, and, and this is one of the most expensive aspects of a hospital system. And so one of the studies that we did is, can we actually better predict the time of a cataract surgery? Because cataract, at least in the developing world, is, I think, in the developing world, is the most uh, common surgery that we see. And so they used a tool called AutoML. This is a Google tool. 
AutoML actually kind of simplifies the creation of, of AI models. One of the things that we were able to show is actually we could increase the rate of we can predict the time that surgery is going to take for cataracts by 33%. This allowed for you know, all the optimizations that we hear about all the time. One of the things that was so important with this is our ability to actually demonstrate how confident in some of the explainability assets. And so what you kind of see, and I'll talk about on the next slide, is uh, their tools that Google has built have actually built in explainable asset effects. So when using any of the Vertex tools or any of our AI suite, we build in and make it as easy as possible to surface things like, okay, how confident is the model at any given time? This is an example of, um, you know, not only does it have the confidence intervals, this is my favorite part, we actually are highlighting the pixels of the image of where it is, where it came to the conclusion and what pixels showed it that. Now, this might not mean a lot for people that don't know how to look at an eye and think that might be a longer cataract surgery, but this definitely is, goes very far for people who are trying to fi find why something is happening and they can't understand why it's making this conclusion. One of my favorite aspects of explainable AI is it will also show you when things are going wrong. So in this particular example, um, the, the model was saying, I think this chest X-ray you know, has not nodules or was making a prediction that a radiologist said, I don't think that's accurate. What's kind of going on here? And they looked into the, uh, you know, pulled up the screen and actually it's highlighting, well, there were pen marks on the X-ray and that's why it is making that recommendation. And so as a clinician, if they don't, you know, you could easily go in and say, well, why are you making that inference? And the explainability factor brings your trust so much more to the forefront because you're able to say, yes, I can agree or no, those are pen marks that shouldn't be there. And clearly I can kind of ignore this recommendation. I think my favorite example is, um, you know, we were playing around early in the day, we would try and do readmission prediction um, on some of the kind of open Medicare data that CMS provides. And um, the number one uh, risk of readmission for, I think it was heart disease, was whether or not the male had gray hair. And I, you pull that up as a variable and you're like, that probably, we should probably remove this variable from our data set. And these are the kind of explainability aspects that are so important to think through when building responsible AI, because you might build a model, train the entire thing, utilize it, and find out that your most heavily weighted variable is not something, you know, either introduces bias or is not something that you actually want to be, we know isn't necessarily predictive of what you're trying to show. Um, this is kind of a really good wrap-up example of um, one of the amazing things and by building all of these tools and having kind of end-to-end -end transparency, explainability, responsibility in our tooling, we can now actually surface that to the people that need to be hearing it. So one of the um, one of our favorite use cases is there's um, and close to my heart in the women's health world, kind of better understanding and better prediction of when diagnosing uh, Pap smears and actually looking at the pathology slides. And this is one of the kind of areas that we see the most advancement in because pathology tends to be the largest and least digitized, but actually has can show some of the most best some of the most promising results in terms of the applicability of AI. Yep, pathology slides are huge. They're basically four-dimensional images and there's so many, there's so much data held within that. And so just looking at it from a microscope, as a pathologist would, um, may not be able to show all the insights that a full generative AI uh, embedding would be able to kind of bring about. And so these are the things that we see as really forefront in making sure that the adoption of AI is happening. Now, uh, gave all a great talk about how we're thinking about responsibility. One of the things, and to really bring it back to even earlier, is um, there's still kind of a lot more to do in terms of the overall industry and in AI. Um, we haven't yet thought about how can a patient consent to use of AI. 
So if they come in, they don't want a generative chatbot to be you know, communi to communi communicating with them. They actually want to speak to a doctor. There's not great ways for us to consent to treatment but or using my data for research. We know how the, the BAA's world, world goes. And so um, thinking through kind of the patient advocacy aspects of this and how we're making sure that this can be something that not only the clinicians trust or, or researchers trust, but something that patients trust as well. Because explainability for a clinician is very different than explainability for a patient. And you have to have different interfaces and different data um, and, and specialization and, and kind of up-leveling or low-leveling depending on who you're talking to. And so we need to be able to support kind of the wide, wide range of people we're actually explaining this information to. The other thing I think that's kind of more and more coming about, but the democratization of both data and models. Right now, models are not that portable. And so doing things like federated learning, training on a data set, and actually saying, I want to make it more equitable and train on a different data set and see what the results are over here. That's, uh, we're coming a little bit of a way, but we're pretty far from kind of portability of both um, the you know, data assets as well as kind of models and, and foundational models especially. The final one is really um, the, the, the kind of integration of the explainability. So um, standardizing how this is happening, where the inf what information should be reported, and where it should be reported. And so that is my talk. And I think, oh, I, we missed a slide. But there was a slide that said, so anyways, if you want to learn more. Uh, <laughs> and that was a good cue in to, to my next presenter. So a lot of what we do is only kind of possible by our partners. And so I'm excited to work, well, have a warm welcome of our Onyx presenters and some of our partners that are really close in the public sector and healthcare space to really make all of the things we talked about come to life. Hey everyone, we are between you and lunch. So a lot of, a lot of really exciting stuff happening in this space uh, as part of Onyx. You know, really excited to be here to talk to you. Uh, real quick, you know, when we're putting this slide together uh, and, and being able to, to come and have this conversation, you know, Ron, who, who will introduce himself here in a minute, was talking about his, you know, vast experience in healthcare. And I started thinking about it and, you know, I, I've been around in technology for a little bit myself. My first project or one of my first projects uh, while I was still going to school full time and working full time was uh, a Y2K mainframe to Unix migration. So for those that don't remember, Y2K was when programmers had to program with such small amounts of data that we were afraid that the new millennia was going to cause havoc everywhere. Luckily, mostly it didn't. But think about that just in the span of 24 years to where we're sitting up here on stage talking about reading and asking intelligent questions to a book that we've digested and getting an answer back in seconds, right? That is uh, really just amazing, uh, something that keeps me excited to be in technology and just, uh, you know, outside of that amazing intro of doing some Y2K stuff, you know, I'm the head of a, sh uh, not, I used to be the head, I'm the uh, director of delivery at Onyx uh, for all the public sector, so that's a little bit from pre-sales all the way down to making sure that what you work with uh, from a Google technology standpoint and us is uh, working as expected. Prior to that, I spent time in Google public sector where a lot of you may know me as JJ. I'm also go by that, that works just fine. Uh, IT infrastructure and automation is kind of my passion. So I spent time at HashiCorp building out their PSO organization, um, another stint at Google and a lot of my career at uh, Newstar kind of touching on different points of where technology's been since the 90s to where we're at today. And with that, I'm really happy to share the stage with my good friend, Ron. Okay, uh, I think it's still good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Really want to thank Patrice and Craig for allowing us to give this presentation and be in, in front of all of you. Um, as uh, Jeremiah said, we know we're holding between you and lunch, so we put our 270 slide deck away, and we're just gonna approach something a little simpler for <laughs> you. So yeah, given a background of me, is I'm much more mission-driven. Uh, started in research, doing cancer research many years ago. In fact, uh, I was, a, I would say, the lead in bioinformatics at the time, which considered me hitting a button called sort on Excel. 
and that was my limits of uh, bioinformatics. And now where we're at, as you guys know better than I, of where we're at. Uh, the thing that I still remember when I started research was the fact that I uh, identified a new gene that I said is involved in gastrointestinal cancers called prostaglandin dehydrogenase. And it was pointed out to me, you're wrong. And I said, why? And they said, because that's not a cancer gene. That's a gene involved in women giving birth. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to spend the next year to 18 months proving to a lot of my scientist colleagues in that, that it actually was a, a very involved gene in the COX-2 pathway in prostaglandins and all that. And then we wrote the paper and did all that. Actually, I got the gray hair from writing the paper on that one because <laughs> uh, there were quite a few reviews on that. Um, so did that, then realized that research takes a long time to get into clinical care. You know, whatever the statistics are, I hear 17.4 years, but that's an old number, of research to clinical care. So I was like, okay, can I move over to the clinical side and draw the research in? All this great research everybody's doing, can I stand over there and pull it in? So I was recruited over to the Cleveland Clinic to run medical genetics. And I was like, okay, now I'm in the clinical side at the number two hospital in whatever, the US or the world, now I could draw all this great research in. And it still was slow. And I was like, okay, now what? So after that, I was uh, uh, moved to a spinoff company to say, okay, I'm gonna learn business. And whatever these business terms are, ROI and stuff like that, I've gotta learn these so I can talk to researchers and talk to clinicians and investors and all that and try to bring it together. So I'm trying to understand the ecosystem. So I got to work with a phenomenal gentleman, Michael Gorton, who uh, co-founded a company called Teladoc. So uh, he started a new company, Recuro Health. So I went and worked with him, working on digital platforms. And how can I bring digital platforms into healthcare? And how do I use that? When I was um, contacted by Onyx, which is a 20 year partner with Google, really understood it. And I said, okay, I was sitting there one day and I said, if I'm gonna make a, a real powerful uh, impact on healthcare, why not uh, partner with a technology behemoth and figure this out and really mash into it? I understand clinical trials, I understand RRBs, I understand research, you know, I've talked to doctors and EHRs, all that sort of thing, all the data. You know, I asked the silly question one time in a data governance meeting, do we know where all our data sources are? And I was told, go sit in the back and don't ask any more questions. So I was like, okay. So then I, at, at Onyx now, working with Google, my goal is how do I partner with everybody here? You guys are the ones on the ground doing the work. I now see AI. I see that coming to the forefront. I've been in this, you know, when I first started doing research, again, I don't care if you know how old I am, uh, I start looking at some of the data that was coming out about HIV in the 80s. Then I worked through at the VA during the Gulf War and all the, um, antibiotic stuff that we were dealing with. And you know, everything since then, I've never seen something like this. This is phenomenal. It's, it's gonna, it, it's already shaking the world. I told a group of healthcare leaders, it was a bunch of hospital CEOs that were pretty much afraid of AI. They asked me a couple weeks ago, what is your um, advice to us? And I said, well, honestly, because I only know one, one form is candid. I don't know how to sugarcoat it. I said, right now, your colleagues are using it, your competitors are using it, and unfortunately, cyber criminals are using it. So you've got to get into this space, work with a technology partner that you trust, and start figuring it out. As you saw with Vivian's great presentation, there's so much work to be done, but we need everybody to be part of this. It's not like we're up here saying, we've got candy, who wants candy? You take it and you go away. No, I want to have a long-term partnership with you of what are your problems, what are you dealing with, and how do we, we help with that? So, And that leads in a little bit to, you know, who is Onyx? And first of all, we have some other great partners here, uh, and I'm really excited to be here. You know, we heard about, you know, trusted AI, and, and I think having trusted partners are also just critically important. And just because we're on stage is not to take anything away from our other great partners that are here that uh, can help you solve your problems as well. And obviously we all work uh, closely with Google and Kerasoft, so you know, thanks again. But a couple of quick highlights that you know, a lot of folks don't hear about Onyx, a lot of times partner implementation teams just kind of get work done at large institutions. You know, they are helping do the Google technology or whatever technology it is at the time. 
A couple of quick notes that I, I really think are uh, pretty amazing is uh, Onyx has been around for about 30 years uh, or so, founded in the Cleveland, Ohio area. We have been 13 times partner of the year, uh, a little bit over 1,400 employees right now. And, you know, something uh, that Ron's really proud of, and we have the banner back, is 2023 uh, partner of uh, Healthcare and Life Sciences. And then we also uh, acquired a company last year, Data Medica, which they had won the data analytics specialization in 2023. We've also been a Google partner for 20 years, right? So we started in 2002 with search, and then we grew into uh, Workspace, which is now what it's called. Obviously, it's G Suite for Business and GCP. And over the past two years specifically is where we've really leaned into being more of that delivery and implementation partner. So we've invested heavily in kind of matching Google of what the technology stacks are looking at, that they're trying to implement, that the customers need, and having the ability to help them scale by going out and working with customers like you. So qu quick, uh, quick pitch on who Onyx is. All right, so some, some of the federal health technology pain points that we see, and these are just you know, a smattering of what I'm seeing out there. Uh, but as we're talking about how do we help you, one of the problems that I'm hearing over and over again is recruitment and retention. So though that may not seem like a healthcare related problem, trying to keep some consistency within groups, within companies, within organizations, institutions, hospitals, whatever, is a key factor to me. And so I'm looking, trying to go through the Google ecosystem and find ways that we can help with recruitment retention and things like that. So to me, that's important. I don't care if it's a small lab with a few scientists or a huge organization, how do I get the right people in? You know, the fire in the belly, the right people into, into my work. Uh, this new thing that I'm hearing about shadow AI, which when I first saw it, I was like, okay, what's this one? You know, I've heard of, you know, shadow files and stuff like that with EHRs, but now hearing about how uh, employees are starting to use AI separate from whatever the system's allowing. So you're developing this whole nother network uh, that you have to be aware of. Obviously cybersecurity. This, this is beyond belief, the stuff that I'm hearing going on. And you guys are probably even hearing, you know, worse stories that I've, than, than I've come across. Um, lack of a public health IT infrastructure. So we've talked about interoperability, which is the next one, but what is interoperability? I had a real good discussion with Zach this morning where he was talking to me about the interoperability and the pieces parts as I try to define that. Is that EHRs talking to each other? Good luck. You know, are you talking about hospitals talking to each other? Good luck. I was at uh, the health informatics meeting uh, last year and one of the biggest things they brought out, this was a highlight was we have a new fax machine for hospitals. <laughs> I'm at a loss. I was like, a fax machine? But they were actually highlighting it in that. And I, you know, the only thing I didn't do was cry, because I was like, that's it? Um, and then the common standards for collecting healthcare data, which is, is key. And again, it's like, how do we do it? It's not how do I do it, or how does Jeremiah and I do it, or Google even. It. It's how do we do it? How are we going to approach this? So I think some of the things we could talk about here is you sort of see this risk reward. We totally get it. There's a lot of risk going on. But again, being part of this, working with a group like Kerasoft, Google, and all the other partners that are here, how do we get to be part of this so we can help control the risk? There, there is a big risk, but at the same time, there's a big reward. And again, as I pointed out, everybody's starting to use AI, so you ne sort of need to get into it. Uh, it was estimated about $100 billion spent on it last year. 98% uh, of healthcare providers are, are going to start using this. Anomaly detection that we heard about a little bit with Vivian's presentation. And the big point to think about that a lot of times I tell is like, yes, would we like to sit on it for five to six, seven more years, study it, do better security, do better everything, but the horse is out of the barn. It's already out there, it's already being used, so we've got to jump in. And it's also, I firmly believe in augmenting my, my position, it's not replacing. There could be certain um, tasks that will be replaced, more administrative than that, but my goal is how do we get to augment what you're doing, add it on to what you're doing, not sitting here trying to replace people. And yeah. then- yeah. Well, on top of augmenting the work, it's also, you know, up leveling your junior employees, right? The, those that are just coming out into the workforce, they may not know all the things that a 20 plus year 
senior research scientist is going to know. But with these tools in your organizations, with data that you have worked with Google to help train, they can kind of solve for themselves. So it, again, it takes toil away from their senior researchers, and it also gives these amazing tools to, you know, kind of the just out of college, just getting their career going to kind of up-level either the skill that they were hired for or to learn a new skill fairly quickly. And then the concern of the black box, which I'm you know, keeping track of. Again, we're working with Google and what they're trying to do and being part of that. So you understand how it's being built, what's being built and, and those things. So again, risk reward, but to me, it's like we got to get in as a whole group and figure out how do we make this the reward to reduce the risk. Yeah, and you do that by building on the you know, amazing panel that we had this morning, hearing the live demos, which before Gen AI, did anyone ever do a live demo that actually worked? Um, you know, so there's a lot of really uh, great pieces that we've heard about that kind of builds on this. So I really hope that's resonating for you to take back to your, your companies, your organizations, and your teams to say, this is real, this is now, these are a bunch of different ways that we can make this happen. So the way that Onyx is looking at this is uh, very similar to what we heard Google talk about earlier, right? So we want to be there for the innovation. We want to help you mature in your organization or your processes that you're working through. Maybe you already got some things happening. Uh, let's find ways to optimize it, right? Because at the end of the day, things are expensive. We want to make sure that everything we do is cost conscious. And you know, for, for myself anyways, being in public sector, and I'm sure for you all in, in your industries, we're doing this for the end goal of actually helping real live people and their experiences, right? So we want to make sure that we're keeping the end goal in mind, but not using technology in a way that uh, is uh, cost negative, I guess. We'll use that. Uh, and then security, right? Who, who wants to make sure their data is secure? Um, you know, Google has you know, many great tools, uh, I think, that we heard during one of the earlier slides today as well, the way that they protect your data um, while you use these amazing, new, rapidly advancing tools. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you know, I really want to take away that Onyx doesn't just do one type of implementation. We have uh, specialties across the board uh, from Workspace, which we heard about a couple times today, security and governments. And then the one critical piece that most companies overlook is change management, right? We have a really strong team that can come in and actually help you and your organization navigate these new tools going in and how that is impacting those end users and making sure that you're excelling with the tools as we help roll them out to your company. So just so you know, two more slides, I think, so then we can hit over at lunch. Um, but some of the use cases that I've seen, and unfortunately I can't talk about which companies or hospitals or whatever we're working with because we have a lot of uh, non-disclosure, but trying to work with AI to help with clinical uh, applications. So working on a few right now where we're using AI to bring in some of the data, review the data faster, and feedback as clinical decision support. Uh, do a lot of healthcare and AI consulting and talking to groups. Again, my goal is to be your partner. It's not, if you look at me as a vendor, I did something wrong. I'm trying to come in and be your partner and say, okay, we're gonna be with you in the long term. Uh, so how do we start working on things? Doing AI workshops, looking at contact center AI, because as we're finding out, especially in the hospital system, there's a, a lack of physicians and now nurses uh, to take care of all these patients. So we're trying to figure out how do we offload some of that beginning stuff into a contact center? How do you use chatbots in that? And I get it because, you know, believe me, I talk to a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, this is not possible. And it's like, well, it, even if it wasn't, you're in such dire straits right now that it has to be possible. So we have to go after this direction. Um, Medical imaging was what I wanted to jump to because I was talking to a hospital system said medical imaging suite that Google has. Uh, and they're like, well, you're telling me this will save me money. Tell me how. And so I had to sit there a second and said, okay, here's what. Right now you're trying to hire two radiologists. Let's guess, $250,000 each. Uh, add some you know, benefits in and whatever. So that's half a million. And you can't find them, let alone if you do hire them, you're, you're still down half, you know, half a million. But using medical imaging suite, if we can help make your radiologist 20% more efficient by reviewing some of the slides, augmenting their intelligence, not replacing, and giving them the indications of, we've looked at 250,000 slides of this, or, or you know, images of this, this is what we think it is. 
they're like, okay, now I see where you're going. You're helping me with my system. So you're not coming at me telling me, oh, it's, it's cheaper, it's better. It's, you know, it's gonna solve all your problems, but we have to work as partners to figure out what is it that you're up against and what are you dealing with? Mental health applications, we've heard about that. It's, it's ridiculous out there. And part of it is because it's tough for getting reimbursement for mental health. So I'm trying to work with some of the payers of how do we start working on that end of it. So I'm working with payers, pharma, research, hospitals, uh, all of them, because it's like, what are the problems? How do we pull this ecosystem together? Instead of, you know, we heard it earlier, it's like a word we're not supposed to use, silos, but it's like, <laughs> it does exist. You know, when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, I'd go talk with researchers because I could talk with researchers and hear what they're doing. Then I'd go talk to physicians. I was like, how come you guys aren't talking to each other? And, and they're like, oh, you know, research is seven to 10 years out and doctors have to deal with stuff six to 12 months. So I was like, yeah, but you know, something's not working here. And then I did the same thing with clinical trials when I was at uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology several years ago. And I see where somebody that can handle clinical trials is, is key is that I was talking to the pharma companies. They said their number one problem is getting patients. Okay. I went and talked to the advocacy groups in the hospitals. Our number one problem is getting on a clinical trial. I, I'm at a loss. <laughs> it's a multi-billion dollars of, of a system and it can't come together. So talking to companies that can bring this together is critical. And then the multi-omic suite where we're starting to figure out how do you do proteomics, transcriptomics, all, all the other omics that I haven't even figured out yet. So we're starting into those. And how do we bring that in? Again, how do we work with you to say, okay, what are you trying to do? Because I understand it. You just give me the, the high level words. I'll figure out what you're doing and then say, okay, here's some things that we can come in and help tweak or do or bring partners in that can help you. And then the usual data analytics, as Jeremiah said, you know, large data migration, security reviews, analytics. Security is becoming critical. You know, stuff I'm hearing and probably what you're hearing is beyond belief. I never thought of this before. I just want to share, you know, got just two minutes or so, but I was talking to a security company and they actually had this happen. And they couldn't tell me the company, but they said, so what they did is they used AI to scrub social media especially Glassdoor and that, to find who is upset with their company. Okay, that seemed reasonable. Now I've identified somebody that's upset with their company. Then they used it to go through all the social media to find who has medical problems in their family, which could identify that they're at financial risk. And they went and approached these people and offered them a million dollars. There's an actual case. I'll give you a million dollars. If you take this USB, plug it into the computer on the day you quit, and we won't even activate it for six months. So they won't even know it was you. And it's like, damn, these, these guys are really, are pushing the limits. So we've got to fight against that. And that's one of the reasons I'm so glad to be partnered with Google, because it's like, I can't figure it out. I, you know, many of the academic medical centers I'm working with have like five cybersecurity people, five, to cover all the stuff they're doing with EHRs and all the telehealth and everything else. You walk over to Google, I can't remember, it's thousands now. So it's like, that's what we need to be focused on. And, yeah, then, and that's it. I think we have uh, three minutes and then lunch. But one thing I want to say is, so I, I wore a shirt that stuck out. And I pretty much see that nobody else has a red shirt on. So come talk to me. You find me, you know, red shirt. Talk to me about your problems. What are you up against? What can I help you with? Uh, what can we do? Where can we bring Google in? Where can we bring our other partners in? Uh, I also realized red's like a target, so I didn't think too well on that one. But really hoping for that, what I'm hoping happens today is that we talk about, tell me what the problems are, even if you're just venting and say, Jesus, what I got to deal with today. You know, boss was yelling at me. I was like, okay, I have that too. So, you know, we'll go grab a beer and we'll be okay. <laughs> but that's what I'm really asking is allow us to come in and be partners with you. This is amazing, the access that we have here today. And we want to enable you to do your work better, more secure, and really advance it. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Onyx. That was wonderful. And we look forward to growing this partnership. Uh, before we break for lunch, I want to call out two folks on my team. Dave Bellardo. Where are you, Dave? <laughs> He's in the back. And Justin Kerr. Great. So please.
please reach out to Justin and Dave. Uh, they are not just technologists, they are your advocates, both on the partner and customer side. Uh, they are aligned to your mission. And please, um, you know, give them a call, talk to them today, ask them questions. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, lunch is served across the hall. And please grab lunch and make sure that you get to every partner here to ask them what they're doing with Google Cloud. I appreciate it. If you were excited about the first half of today, you are going to be more excited about the second half. We have the National Cancer Institute here. Dr. Oliver Bogler will be presenting after lunch. Dr. Kayvon Farahani uh, from NIH. Uh, and Deloitte will be presenting the Medical Imaging De-Identification Suite. And Ron Bouchard, who runs our Mandiant business, will be talking to you about security along with Palo Alto Network. So grab lunch and get ready for the second half of an exciting day. All right. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Oliver Bogler, the director for the Center for Cancer Training at the National Cancer Institute. He's going to tell us all about a really cool mobile application to foster communication and support research. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Oliver Bogler. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. And thank you, Patrice uh, and the team for having me here today. I'm a little intimidated. Uh, I'm a cancer biologist, um, so please be kind to me. Uh, I'm not one of you uh, smart tech people. Um, but I'm a tech enthusiast. I have over 300 projects on Kickstarter that I've, uh, if, if that counts as any kind of uh, credibility. Okay, so um, I work in the Center for Cancer Training, so I think every day about early career cancer scientists, people in their undergraduate years, graduate students, postdocs, and I talk to them all the time. I've been doing this work for over 20 years. I joined NCI four years ago, and what I've heard from them consistently is a couple of things. One is they're overwhelmed, and the other is they're isolated. So. About two or three years ago, we started working on this project to try and address these two core um, issues. So this is a quote. You can find similar quotes everywhere. But to remain competitive um, throughout their career, clinicians and researchers have to stay up with the publications in their field. Um, and that's a major challenge because the good news is that biomedicine is exploding. You know that. Healthcare is exploding. And that's fantastic. And that's fabulous. And it's wonderful. And it's a great time to be alive. And we're developing at the NCI new approaches and supporting the development of new approaches to cancer every day. But it also means that our, our, our knowledge space is exploding. And yet the human brain uh, you know, just, uh, stubbornly refuses to grow. So this is just a little graph here of uh, PubMed papers uh, exploding over the years. Uh, when I was a graduate student in the late 80s, you, know, you could keep up with a couple of dozen journals maybe and you'd be pretty in good, pretty good shape. Now I think there's over five, 600 papers in cancer every day, right? So that's why uh, a lot of people look like this young lady who is uh, artificially in, in, uh, generated by um, uh, Google's Gemini. She's sitting there with stacks of papers either side of her and uh, challenged. So I asked Gemini, how can a scientist keep up with the scientific literature? And it came up with some really good suggestions, right? Uh, do targeted searches, uh, do smart filtering, hone in on what you, what you want, collaborations, talk to people. Uh, do effective reading, right? Make time you ha make sure you have time in your busy day for the literature, um, and uh, avoid the overload. Be selective. So obviously, uh, Gemini also suggests some tools like Google Scholar and other things. But we would encourage scientists today. That's our plan to also think of this new app that we're building, Nancy uh, by NCI, uh, as another tool in their toolkit to address these issues. So I'm really happy uh, that Nancy is being co-developed. Um, with a small startup, a small uh, group in, in the UK, Barnacle Labs, and the Google Cloud team. So uh, we're new to the family, but we're excited to be here. Please be kind to us. Um, Nancy, its mission is to f use AI to find scientific content in the broadest sense and scientific connections in that broader sense as well to help cancer researchers. I work at the NCI, I have to put the word cancer in. But I'm cool if all biomedical scientists use it uh, to build a successful and fulfilling career to end cancer as we know it and other human diseases as well. So that's what's exciting. Uh, we launched our MVP um, a few months ago, and the focus of this initial product is to help manage the scientific literature. So that's kind of our focus. 
And we have sort of two axes of recommendations that I'll show you in a minute in a live demo. I know, right? Um, uh, that, that help uh, our scientists, our users find interesting content. And we are also developing new ways based on AI uh, to interact with the literature. So here we go, live demo time. <coughs> um, if, if you would please uh, switch me over to the uh, Zoom meeting, that would be great. AV team, hello. Help. Okay. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to open up the app here. And the core, uh, as I said, the core technology or the core use right now is, is uh, around the literature. So the home page of the app is uh, the page we call papers, the tab we call papers. And one of the core idioms that we have is that of folders. So the way you declare interests to the AI, what am I interested in, uh, is by creating folders that contain papers around a particular topic. And this allows you to go beyond, for example, your published CV, right? We pull in your ORCID ID and we've seen what you've published, but scientists are interested in things other than what they've published on, and they change direction sometimes, and maybe they're just interested in a field they're never going to publish in, but they're still interested. So what you do is you create folders here, and here are my folders on my homepage, and the folders uh, have papers in them, uh, and you see at the top there uh, a recommendation um, banner. That was the recommendations uh, I received uh, yesterday, I guess, um, and the papers underneath the ones that I've placed in the folders that the AI is using. So let me just show you what papers look like in Nancy. So uh, we give you a cool little image um, that that's what the paper looks like to an AI, okay? Um, then we extract some keywords there, and we give you a one-sentence summary of the paper. So this is a quick way when you're looking at a paper you're not familiar with, what's this paper about? Is this something I should look at further? You can see there uh, a one-sentence uh, one summary, and then uh, you can, this paper is bookmarked in my folder. If it wasn't, you could add it to a folder. We give you some citations. We give you the relative citation ratio. That's the, uh, the number in orange there. This paper is cited more than other papers in its field, uh, normalized to field size. So obviously a paper that's attracting attention. You can see the reference papers, the citations, and you can also read the full abstract. And depending on what its accessibility is, you can actually access the full paper here. This is a, a paper in, uh, in, in public access and unpaywall. You can actually read uh, the entire paper here on the app. You can also see the um, authors and, um, and navigate the author tree if you want to look at other things that they've published. Let's see if I can... Okay, so let's look at the recommendations. So these are, um, you can set these for daily or weekly, but you get recommendations, three always, of, of papers that we think are a good match for the papers that you've put in that particular folder. And you can have as many folders as you want and therefore get as many recommendations on different subjects as you'd like. And then you can evaluate these papers uh, depending on, uh, and, and either add them to your folder or discard them and you can give feedback to the app uh, on, the, on, the, on the quality of fit as well. So that's really the algorithmic axes of recommendation. But we feel that there's another axis, which is a social aspect of recommendation, right? People. People also have things to recommend. So we have a way of liking folders. So what you saw here are my folders. These are Oliver's folders. And these are the folders made by other people that I have liked. And uh, I'm just going to open up one here. Uh, let me scroll down. Um, I like a lot of folders. Um, so this is a, a one by uh, Duncan Anderson. He's actually the, the principal uh, software architect of Nancy. He uh, used to be IBM Watson CTO Europe. He now works in a small startup. And he is very interested in AGI, right, as we are all. And as I am, but I'm no expert. But Duncan is an expert. So here I have an expert in a field, and I can watch the papers that he is bookmarking into this folder. And actually, since I like this folder, whenever he adds another paper to this folder, I'll get a notification. Hey, Duncan has added another paper. Maybe you want to go check it out. And you can actually interact with this group of papers as well. You can't at this stage get recommendations on Duncan's uh, folder. We are thinking of giving you the ability to clone that into one of your own, and then you could also get recommendations on it. So that is kind of the social axis of recommendation that we're building. And of course, both of, both of these are nascent. They are our first um, uh, product in this, in this, or first iteration of this product uh, that, we're, that we've built um, with lots of uh, additional places to go. Okay, so how do you get papers uh, into, a, uh, into a folder? Well, you basically search PubMed, and we have not fully indexed PubMed yet. We're jealous that uh, Google has. Um, but let's just say you were particularly interested in Dr. Farhani's uh, research. You could do a PubMed search uh, for him 
And for example, you'll find a paper on the NCI Imaging Data Commons there. And again, you can open it up. That's actually not an AI generator image. That's an actually photograph of the way the Data Commons looks on the inside. All right, it's a tough crowd. You guys are still asleep. It's lunch. <laughs> Okay, that was a joke. Um, again, there's a one page, uh, one sentence summary, excuse me, um, and you can see the citations and the other information. But let's do something uh, cool here. Let's chat with the paper. Um, so now we've basically uh, imported the, the paper and made it ready for uh, interrogation. And if you knew about this subject, which I do not, you could right away type in the bottom there a question. I, I'm, I don't really know uh, that much about the NCI Data Commons, so I'm going to hit the Inspire Me button, and that will allow me to the AI to generate some questions I might ask. So I think a use case here might be, you know, someone joining your lab, maybe it's a summer student, an undergraduate, and you're like, hey, here's a folder of papers to read, um, but they're not really sure what, what to ask, right? They're gonna look at these things and they can, so they can lean on the AI that's trying to make some important and relevant questions. So always part of the questions are, what's the key hypothesis, takeaway, and uh, further research. But here you can see some uh, three paper specific um, questions that it's generated, I, and I'm going to ask Kayvan to pick one. This is audience interaction. Which one would you like to me to click on? First one. Okay. So let's see how well it does. So it's now interrogating the paper, and it's basically coming back with an answer. Um, currently, this answer is at, at just at the regular level. We are we envisage in the future being able to use uh, present these at different levels. For example, you know, like summarization at high school level or undergraduate level, and so on. Again, with the use case of junior scientists joining it. I don't know. What do you think, Kevin? Is that answer good? It's fine. Okay, good. We also. <laughs> And I, he's not a plant. He didn't know this was going to happen. So uh, just, I mean, you know, we do work in the same shop more or less, but uh, that, that, that was not the case. And then it does source, um, give you the sources, the specific parts of the of the papers. And you can do this chatting with papers also at the folder level. So you can chat simultaneously with a group of papers to get a broader view of things. Now, um, let me see uh, here. Um, I'm going to ask a question of my own. I'm going to ask who is the CEO of Google? Cloud. And of course, uh, that was not in that paper. It could have been, but it wasn't. Uh, so the AI very reliably gives you a non-hallucinatory answer. It just says, I don't, have, I don't have that information. I can't give you that information. So it's a very constrained, uh, through prompt engineering, very constrained AI, because of course, the worst thing we could do is to tell you something that's actually not in that paper. Uh, so we, we've worked quite hard to make sure that this is a reliable thing. Um, I don't know what sources will do here. There was no source. I'm not going to click on it. <laughs> but um, th that's an important thing, use case for us in science, of course, um, as well. Okay. Uh, so let's say I was really, oh, this is a really interesting paper. This is, I want to know a lot more about this, so I can bookmark this. Now, I might have a folder already uh, for it, but I might not. Um, so I might just call it, um, what shall I call it? Imaging, uh, imaging science. It's probably a terrible name. I can, I like my emojis because I'm a visual person. Uh, so I can, I'm going to use this skyscraper picture and I'm going to create that folder. And um, then I have to find it. That's the, there it is. Uh, and then I'm going to bookmark it. And so now the paper is being pulled into this, into this folder. And if I add two or three more papers and set up the recommendations the way I want to, I'll start learning about um, Kayvan's science and what he's, what, what, what's going on in that field. Uh, and I can start to follow it. So that's the core functionality uh, of science, uh, of papers, excuse me, in the app. And we also have people. So that's, of course, an important thing. We're essentially, um, you could say, uh, uh, building a kind of a social network on the scientific literature. Um, so here you'll just see recent users. But let me show you the profile. You can present yourself here in the app. Um, you have followers and following people. It tells you a little bit. It's extracted some things from my publications on what it thinks the kind of sciences that I used to do. And I, I haven't done science myself in a long time, but I used to work on gliomas and platinum compounds and other kinds of things. Uh, it can pull in data from all kinds of other systems. Uh, it knows my aliases. It, if I've put anything about my Vita into ORCID, it'll have that. It'll have authored papers uh, as well pulled from ORCID. But I think interestingly are the folders. So these are my folders that I've made. You may recognize some of them from the, from the first part. Um, and these are the ones that I've made public. So you can have private folders and you can have public folders. And if you have public folders, they appear under your profile just like that. Now, if you were looking at this, there would be a little heart icon on each of these folders. And you could click it to like that folder and follow it the way I showed you that I was following Duncan's folder. Or you could choose not to and then you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be bothered by it. But those are my public folders. And then, of course, I also have followers. Um, so these are people on the app, the little blue check mark. Uh, 
it does not cost $8 a month. Um, it means that you're a user on the app because you can also follow authors on PubMed. So you can follow someone who's never heard of Nancy on PubMed. And then, for example, if they get a, if they pop a paper into Buyer Archive, one of the preprint servers, you can get a notification. So that's a cool way of staying up to date on things. But you can see the vast majority of people that I follow, not everybody um, is a user on the app. And I'm particularly proud of uh, the one of our latest users, Dr. Rathmel, who joined the NCI just a few uh, months ago as our director. Um, and she's very fond of dogs, so there's a, her profile picture. And you can see she's got folders. So here you can see the liking of the folders. I have liked four of her folders. I'm gonna like her disparities folder too. And she will actually get a notification right now saying, hey, Oliver liked your disparities folder. Um, and then again, I can keep up with what she's doing and um, her followers and her information. And of course, you can contact her here right now by email, but we envisage in the future of other modes of con contacting people uh, through the app. Okay, that's people. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, um, areas we haven't quite developed as yet, uh, very much as yet. We have uh, uh, events, which are essentially right now NIH calendar pulled in. And the goal again, this is another type of science learning opportunity, right? Someone's giving a talk. So uh, we would we plan on ingesting this kind of information, not just from the NIH, anybody who's willing to make their uh, calendar ingestible and, and their sessions publicly uh, open to anybody, right? Zoom or what have you. Um, then we can gather an abstract, for example, from the presenter, and we can actually use the matching technology we have to, sh to serve that up to uh, our users. Hey, there's, you know, Professor X at this and this school is giving a talk. You just bookmarked a paper that's in that area, you know, three days ago. Maybe you want to go see his, uh, his or her seminar, right? So right now we have just the NIH calendar, and we also have their fitness. We've um, used some machine learning to categorize these different um, talks, but the, the future, I think, is a way, uh, you know, of, of finding that needle in the haystack uh, to include um, talks. We also have a very simple news reader. We just have a, a bunch of RSS feeds in here focused on cancer that you can switch on and off. And ultimately, we have the intention of creating places where we, ha we could have uh, interactive uh, entities, for example, here. This is not well developed, and I will not demo it, uh, but the idea is that you can have a Nancy chat here, for example, about the NCI. So let's say you come to the NCI again for the summer. You're, you've, never, you've never been to this you know, huge campus on NIH, and you're like, where, where can I get lunch? Yeah. Or you know, is there a gym here? Uh, those kind of questions. Or maybe you know, I, I'm in an emergency, I need some help. Um, so those are, that is what we are planning to do. Um, all right, so that's the live demo over. Whew. I'm going to leave the Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, uh, and it, it, it really just remains for me to say that, you know, right now we are, um, we have some limitations on the app. One of our core um, ideas is that we, we, this will never be open to the general public. So right now you, you have to have a whitelisted email uh, address that is, um, we have about four or 500 academic institutions um, in the whitelist. We're happy to add others. It doesn't have to be just academic institutions, but we do not want to become an open social network. Uh, we want people to be there in their professional capacity, more like LinkedIn than some of the other social networks that, that you might uh, imagine. Um, so that's one of the limitations. The other limitations, and I hesitate to say this at this wonderful meeting, is that right now we're uh, on, uh, only on this uh, operating system by some other company, um, which hurts me because I'm a Pixel super fan, um, but uh, my developers say we should, that that's the most affordable way to start developing. But we have plans uh, to move onto the web and onto um, Android very soon. So I'll pause there, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, try to answer them. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Please. Yes. Exactly. So, um, indeed, we, we feel we do feel this the social aspect and maybe the sort of the, the the alert aspect and the feed aspect would be would be nice on mobile. But uh, when you're seriously thinking about papers and literature and writing and reading, then the web app would be would be good. So we're we're definitely that's definitely on our roadmap. Um, I agree. And you know, one of our other goals is to make uh, the literature as accessible as possible. Um, you know, across the country, and not everybody has access to uh, to phones and, and computers. So we should be on all the pl possible platforms. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I was inspired by the demo, which I think was awesome, and um, was thinking that shifting the focus from the researcher to whom is it you know, focused or whom is it focused to the uh, patient, and could we build something similar for patients because they too 
question for their community. I think that would be amazing. I'd probably do it on the web because that's probably where they would search it, right? So, I mean, obviously you can go to the NCI website and search there right now, but I think something like this would be much more I totally agree with you. So that, that is not something that I will do in my in my area, but we are talking to our colleagues uh, at the NCI, actually, who run the NCI, I forget the exact name now, but when you basically want to ask questions about cancer, um, which is for the public, uh, they are watching what we're doing, uh, and we've been telling them about, you know, what kind of approaches we've been using, and I think they're absolutely interested in that, just like we heard uh, a little bit before lunch about the similar similar approach to that. Totally agree with you. Um, you know, my budget is only small, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do this thing that but you're not wrong. You're absolutely right. I agree with you. Please. Yes. Sorry? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Citizen scientists, I'm very interested in. I mean, if you're willing, and, and one of the things we haven't built yet, but we want to offer the, the, the app, you know, that you can pick your own level. That is something we'd be very interested in. Um, so if we can solve the, the, the whitelisting uh, challenge with that, I would, be, I would be quite interested in that. Also patient advocates and, you know, the nonprofits. And for example, we've also whitelisted all the um, startup companies that NCI funds through its small business initiative grants and things like that. So we're not, we're not so parochial that we're only education, uh, but we don't want to be for everybody. Sorry, <laughs> it's too hard. I can't um, moder moder uh, moderate a social network of that kind. Um, you know. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you. That was fantastic, Oliver. Thanks. The next time uh, we do this, we'll do it from a Google Pixel phone, and then you're. Google Fitbit wearable device. We'll have your fitness uh, integrated with the, with the demo as well. So looking forward to that. And thank you. So I'm really excited about this next presentation from Deloitte Consulting and NIH. Um, I've got a chance to work with uh, the three folks that will be presenting uh, quite often. So it's um, my honor to introduce Dr. Benjamin Kopchik from Deloitte Consulting. He's a senior, uh, um, I'm sorry, a senior consultant at Deloitte. Dr. Kavon Farahani, who's a senior data scientist for imaging and, AI, and the AI program director for National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH. And Dr. Jurgen Klenk, who is the federal health sector's data and AI lead. And there, and feel free to, to take a seat. Um, I know I'm not sure who's up presenting first, but um, today we're going to be talking about um, something that is of great interest. Um, we actually did a poll, and uh, this topic was uh, front and center for a lot of folks. Um, they're going to be talking to you about Google's cloud healthcare API for de identification of medical images. So, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Patrice. I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to, to present about our project uh, with GCP and colleagues at Deloitte. So uh, thanks, Oliver, for putting a plug for Imaging Data Commons because that was the, uh, uh, the core of this project at the beginning was to provide service for image data identification for Imaging Data Commons, which is one of NCI's large uh, image repositories for cancer images, uh, de-identified images. So, so this presentation is obviously about image de-identification and, and what that means is really lowering the risk of identification or re-identification of patients, uh, preserving their privacy, but at the same time providing value through shared data or secondary use of data for development of analytics um, and including AI ML tools. So um, lots of high tech in, in healthcare producing a lot of data and the challenge is how to uh, you know, uh, harmonize that data, those data sets and, and share them for secondary use. And now with the uh, NIH data sharing mandate that went into effect January of last year, um, this, this issue has become front and center for not just medical images, but a lot of medical uh, records and medical data that are generated through NIH support and that need to be shared. Uh, so, again, the, the topic is about preserving 
patient privacy and mitigating risks. So the identification is really about lowering risk because not, nothing is absolutely totally de-identified unless it's and in the context of an image, if it's a white noise, it's basically um, speckles of white and black. But, but otherwise, there are ways to identify uh, perhaps uh, individuals. So, so there's a legal aspect to image de-identification, and that's uh, conforming to HIPAA, uh, Health Insurance Portability, and um, I forget the second P, Act. Um, and uh, that went into effect in 1996. And, um, and then the need at the time when we started in 2020 was to provide services for uh, the imaging data commons. That's the center box that's in yellow, it's hard to read, but that's NCI imaging data commons. And, um, and then the greater need that, uh, or the greater cause that we found since last year is to, uh, to help with the NIH data sharing mandate and provide, um, hopefully provide investigators with, with guidelines and t tools that they can use to de-identify their images that were generated through NIH support and, and share them because most of the time, the, their expertise is not in this area. They're experts in uh, their own area of biomedical science, and through that, they generate medical images. But at some point, they need to share um, for with the community. So, um, so early on, I realized that there were more to to this than just image the identification itself as a pipeline, which was the incentive of this project. But we needed some data to test the identification tools that did not have protected health information or patient identifiers because those cannot be easily shared without you know, certain data transfer agreements and data use agreements. So, um, so the, the core project is the MIDI pipeline, which is a, the, the core of this presentation today that you will hear from my colleagues from uh, Deloitte. Uh, but in the course of that project, we've also uh, had branches into creating data sets with synthetic PHI for testing. Uh, and task group, uh, we brought in uh, about a dozen experts from academia and some from um, professional scientific societies in the area of medical imaging uh, to, to make recommendations for um, image de-identification and best practices in the context of sharing data at the national level and through uh, repositories such as the NCI Imaging Data Commons and otherwise. Um, so the task group um, completed its work March of last year, and their 100-page um, their report is in archive, um, freely available, and we're working on, uh, on publishing a summary of recommendations and best practices in a peer-reviewed journal uh, in the coming months, um, most likely in the Journal of Digital Imaging. And um, so the data sets, we started creating data sets, multimodality imaging data sets from real images from patients, but with uh, synthetic or fake patient names and addresses injected into the DICOM header to allow testing of this pipeline. So that's the MIDI data sets. And then uh, uh, there's a challenge that's coming up uh, in October of this year. Uh, it's essentially inviting tool developers for image de-identification to test their tools against this uh, synthetic data set that we have based on certain conditions and terms that we specify to, to see how their tools will, um, will fare against others. Uh, it's really to, um, much of the effort has been to raise awareness about this issue and, and uh, come into some sort of uh, standards or harmonization in terms of the approaches. Um, and then we had a workshop, virtual workshop last May, which we had 600 attendees or 600 registered and 400 some attendees over two days. All the material is, is openly uh, accessible and uh, also a report of that is, is um, in the works for publication in a peer reviewed journal. Um, so pretty much everything that we produce through this project are accessible. Um, just by way of background, I wanted to, um, in case folks are not familiar with medical images, um, uh, just a little bit about their format. So DICOM, Digital Image communication, Imaging Communication in Medicine, has been around for 38 years. It's a standard that all manufacturers of medical imaging um, systems, CT, MRI, X-rays, mammography systems, uh, they follow and that provides specification about what is the content of the metadata in each image file and also specifications about uh, interoperability with, with medical systems uh, and other EHR systems, et cetera. But at the level that we're talking about, we're looking at uh, single files of images and then series of those and, and, um, and such. So in the left-hand side, uh, there is the simplified DICOM 
data model, which at the very top is the patient, and then a patient might have different studies, uh, and each study might have number of series. Each series is a, uh, is a collection of images that were required the same way, so they could be sagittal scans as shown there, the profile of a head, uh, you know, cuts along, the, uh, along that axis or that plane, and, or it could be different parameters, but essentially they're bunched up into, um, into a series. So each series contains maybe tens or hundreds of images, which they're also referred to as instances. And what's shown on the right is one of those. Um, so it's an image of a, uh, of a subject's head. It's an MRI image. And on top, um, just for the purpose of visualization, uh, showing that a portion of the header, DICOM header. So DICOM header is essentially a matrix of um, tags that each has a content, like patient name, patient ID number, um, the study date, uh, modality that was used, uh, what kind of filter was used for reconstruction of image, etc. So uh, there are hundreds, maybe six, seven hundred of these tags in each file, and not all of them have con have PHI or, or patient identifiers, but a number of them have patient identifiers, and some have pseudo identifiers. Pseudo identifiers are those that can only be um, you know problematic if they're linked to other identifiers and and reveal a patient's identity. So for in the course of the identification, you need to take actions about how to change things, like patient name obviously has to be changed and record number is changed. Um, sh dates are shifted because if you have serial acquisition of um, studies in a clinical trial, for instance, you want to preserve the uh, temporal relationship of those studies to be able to analyze the data the correct way. So um, there needs to be agreement about how dates are shifted and, and those are established in the, in the guidelines. So, um, so at the, the, the beginning of this project was to set up something, uh, a, a pipeline that will um, test the identification. And we started with data sets with synthetic PHI that's uh, shown in the left. And then uh, this is a simple model of image submission and de-identification and then evaluation of the performance by third party just to avoid uh, you know, uh, bias in, in, the, in the course of the project. So, uh, we partnered with colleagues at Deloitte, uh, with Dr. Jürgen Klenk and Ben Kopchik and, and their colleagues, and we've been um, through this journey for the last few years, and it's been it's been exciting to uh, to see our progress and and raising awareness about this uh, this project. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jürgen to to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kivan. So um, just to tap into the uh, challenge a little bit more, and then we're going to open those boxes that uh, Kevan showed you, what's in those boxes, and talk a little bit more about those. So this is a, an example of an image that, that um, it's a chest x-ray that we're having to de-identify. And as you can see, the, um, there is not just um, potentially PHI, PII in the uh, DICOM fields that accompanies that picture here, but there is some information on the image itself, right? So, um, so a reliable tool will have to identify such information and then blank it out uh, so that you can really have both the uh, image as well as the DICOM fields properly de-identified. Now, our medical community is very innovative and they come up with good innovative ideas that make our lives difficult <laughs> as trying to apply machine learning to, to do this task. So, for example, um, you know, they go and write some PHI, PII type of information into some obscure fields in the DICOM records, and there are lots and lots of DICOM uh, fields where they put in a study ID or something like that. They misuse in some ways, or at least that's how we perceive it as data scientists, uh, the purpose of the fields, and they put the information in there. And so your tool has to still find that information, even though it's in the wrong field, and then scrub it from there as well. Um, so the challenge that we had really in configuring, and Ben will talk about this in more detail, was to really go in and figure out what are all the various places in which PHIPI could be found. And, and those best practices that Kevin already alluded to, which is that long list of how you need to handle the, the uh, DICOM fields, uh, that is basically what we had to replicate in the machine doing that automatically and reliably. So. Um, so the problem that we're facing uh, and why, you know, as part of the motivation is, again, imaging is becoming an ever more important modality for biomedical research. And uh, that, as a result, the data set volumes are growing exponentially. 
Um, while maybe in the past you could scrub these records manually, it's just no longer possible at scale, and especially at the scale at which we need those records for machine learning purposes if we want to train on those, on those data sets. Uh, those are going to get very large, and we need automation to, for the identification. So I mentioned the privacy rules that we need to employ uh, to remove all the PHI, PI that's in there. Um, and then um, we looked at cloud-based de-identification tools. And just about when we started the project a few years back, uh, the Google Healthcare API came around, um, which looked like a tool that was very useful because it could read in natively DICOM images and then scrub them with one command, so it seemed. Uh, at the time. Uh, and while that probably did a good amount of the job already, um, the work was then in understanding those best practices and all the ways the, the, the medical practitioners found innovative ideas how to make our lives harder to find the PHI that they had buried somewhere in those fields to find it and, 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 and peel it out and scrub it in the right way. Um, so, uh, so, but the other uh, point that I want to make here real quick uh, is Sharing of these uh, images requires uh, scrubbing the PHI PII out of them so that they can be used for research purposes. And it's really important uh, because there is high hope that uh, clinically relevant results and tools can be developed uh, from large imaging, uh, image data collections. Uh, so here's an overview of the pipeline that we built. Um, and so at the top, you see the image data itself that sort of is fed in. It has PHI PII in it. And then comes a tool that we use the Google Cloud Healthcare API for to do all the scrubbing. And it sort of does it on both ends. On one side, on the DICOM fields, which are text fields that accompany the image, the metadata. And on the other hand, on the image itself. And then you have sort of the validation step that uh, needs to happen to check how well you did based on what image you processed and what the system did and what was it what was it expected to do based on best practices so we had a, a training and test data sets for that purpose um, and an independent uh, validation organization and then that produced a report that ultimately allowed us to assess the valid the validity of the de-identification process um, a couple things to mention um, in that myriad of DICOM fields you will find what's called research critical tags those are information, pieces of information that are important for the scientists if they want to use the images for research purposes. It could be information about the um, device from, that was used for imaging purposes. It could be about the patient, about the findings, um, and so forth on, on the image. Um, and um, what we wanted to also do is we wanted to make sure that uh, we work with a uh, test data set, and I think Kevin mentioned that already, that uh, was uh, kind of safe for us to operate with, uh, which we used the synthetic data set for that was generated um, for us. Uh, that allowed us to really do the work without exposing potential PHI, PI. It led to some funny findings in the end as well. Uh, maybe Ben will have a chance to comment on those and some of the funny findings that happened. Um, where we first scratched our heads why the system was doing certain things and when it shouldn't have done it. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but um, what we're doing now next as a next uh, step here is for Ben to come up and uh, he'll open this box that shows the Google Cloud architecture for us. I'll actually advance the slide to that. And he'll tell you what's in there and how it works. And then we're going to uh, walk you through some of the uh, results of the work that we've done so far. So Ben. Thank you, Jürgen and Kayvon. Uh Yeah, so when we got this project, uh, the key point of it was to build it all out in G with GCP native tools. This was a big point from uh, NCI uh, security team. Uh, they didn't want us having to import a bunch of uh, tools outside uh, that weren't tested and weren't uh, based off of the, uh, their security protocols uh, and weren't, weren't approved by them. So we have used all GCP native tools here uh, to build up this pipeline. Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, but we import the images. Uh, once again, we're using synthetic images, so we're not doing anything like a CTP uh, protocol. Uh, but we're able to uh, get those into cloud storage uh, and then using uh, automation tools such as Cloud Functions, uh, we're able to push it through or uh, cl in Cloud PubSub, 
we're able to push it through to the healthcare API where the data then gets to go sit into a DICOM store. Uh, from that DICOM store, we're able to then de-identify the data and push it to a de-identified DICOM store where then we can do our full analysis on it uh, using Vertex AI and AI notebooks. Uh, one additional point to add here is that all the security protocols and all the logging of all the actions that were being taken, we were able to log those to identify uh, what was happening within the pipeline. Uh, and the step that you don't really see here is within the de-identification API, uh, there's a lot of configuration tools. Uh, so we had the de-identify API has basically three methods to de-identification. You can just de-identify the whole image by just scrubbing out all of the data, uh, which is like this, their safest option. So basically taking the DICOM header, removing all of the data that's not needed to view the image itself, and then give that back to you. Uh, the second is their own algorithm, which is uh, designed to de-identify the data to the best of uh, its ability. And the third is what we did, which was actually do our own configuration of all the tools identify the DICOM tags that we specifically wanted to scrub, uh, as well as take certain actions on uh, to do the de-identification. Uh, and so with that, after going through our architecture, we can dive into some of the results uh, that we uh, have found over the past couple of years. Uh, so the first is that uh, the test data set that I specifically am going to be talking about is the data set that can be found on TCIA. Uh, it is open source. It is now available to everyone after we finish the first uh, couple phases of this project. Uh, and it contains uh, 1,836 images. Uh, and within that, uh, we are able to find uh, one false negative, which is, uh, or one false negative and nine false positives in the uh, DICOM header, uh, no false negatives and two false positives in the Burton image uh, data. And so here, what I am showing you is the image that Jurgen uh, introduced to us earlier, which is the uh, chest x-ray where we have a true positive image de-identification. And the important thing here is that context matters, uh, where the Google de-identification tool was able to identify in the pixel data, in the Burnton pixel, uh, pixel data, that on the top left, there was pixel data that was considered PHIPII. So that is the name, that is the date, and the date of birth. Uh, and it was able to remove those pixels completely. At the same time, we were able to look into the code and identify that it did recognize the text in the top right, uh, but it recognized it as uh, potentially uh, critical information for the researcher and not PHI. So it was able to keep that. And so this is the power of this uh, technology that we've been using uh, for the API that we're able to actually get context, not only within the header data, but within the pixel data as, uh, as well. Uh, we also got some funny issues with some of the images, uh, some of them being a false positive image. image. So here, we were not 100% sure why it de-identified. You can see the black square right in the middle of the de-identified image on the right versus what the original image is on the left. Uh, so this is an example of some incorrectly identified PHI where it's actually partially covering up the image. Uh, but this is also something that we can easily identify and have a what we consider a human in the loop to be part of this process where if the pixel data is covering up uh, data in an area that most likely would not contain PHI, we can actually have a human go in there, check it, and uh, register this now as a uh, incorrectly being identified as PHI and uh, be able to have the image restored to its original uh, format. Uh, so now onto the uh, header data, and this is where we're going to get to some of the funny business that Jurgen uh, was discussing. Uh, the first thing is to identify the green lines or all things that we were positively able to take out of the header data uh, within its context. Uh, we can see what the tag names are there on the uh, on the left. So, for instance, for the first one, we have the additional patient hi history, able to identify. Uh, the name that was in there before the de-identification, then after it, you can notice that we completely scrubbed it. Uh, as the same time, there was some also partial de-identification uh, that could, necess could also necessarily be considered as full de-identification. Uh, so for instance, Harris Community Clinic 
it did remove the name Harris, just leaving community clinic. Uh, without context, you might not be able, you probably would not be able to identify uh, what that community clinic is. Uh, so while we would have liked it to remove all of Harris Community Clinic, uh, removing Harris was at least a partial identification, uh, leaving us with just a uh, name that might not be able to be useful for, uh, uh, for bad actors. Uh, the other interesting case, if you look uh, at the uh, very bottom, uh, we got some instances where uh, the term MR constantly popped up for magnetic, magnetic resonance. Uh, and we identified that the algorithm was actually identifying this as Mr. And then everything that was following after it uh, would be remo would actually be scrubbed. So in this case, the algorithm thought this was Mr. UE, uh, where it actually, re or Mr. Uh, breast, so it removed the word breast. Uh, uh, one other thing is that uh, some of our errors were also due to the nature of the data set being fully synthetic. Uh, so one of the things that we found was that the synthetic data set contained addresses or phone numbers that just were already impossible. Uh, so for instance, in this case, that number at the uh, very top uh, is a area code that does not exist uh, in the United States or even anywhere. So this number is uh, completely impossible. Uh, so what the Google deidentification tool would do is identify it as already being de-identified. De and we saw this multiple times, not only just with phone numbers, uh, but also with a lot of addresses. So a lot of addresses that were part of the synthetic data that were completely made up, the Google tool actually identified them as already being de-identified, uh, even though we were trying to get it to de-identify de something that are, uh, didn't exist. Uh, and that brings us to our uh, final uh, results. Uh, the first thing to point out was that within this uh, test data set, we did achieve an ac accuracy based on actions taken of over 99%. Uh, so actions taken are, if you see those, uh, the chart on the right, uh, you see uh, tag retained, text retained. So it's if we properly retained that tag, did we properly retain text? Uh, did we properly uh, remove text and did we like change the UIDs and did we shift the date to all properly? Uh, and for all those actions that were taken within the uh, data set that we had, it was over 99%. Uh, the other big aspect of this is uh, how long it actually took to do the deidentification. So we had a second data set that was created that had a lot more patients and a lot more images. So for the 93 patients and over 14,000 images, uh, it took just, uh, on average, four minutes and six seconds of runtime, uh, which averages out to about 0 0.017 seconds per image to de-identify, uh, which is very fast and much faster than any human would be able to actually de uh, do the de-identification. Uh, a couple of things just to note on this graph is that we tested it across uh, multiple regions. Uh, so one aspect was using a what's called a multi-region, uh, within GCP, and the other one was a within a single region. Uh, so based off of uh, latency, the multi-region uh, de-identification would take longer on average, uh, where whenever everything was sit sitting in a single region doing the de-identification, uh, it actually uh, performed much faster. And so with that, we have our next phase, which will be discussed by back to Kayvon. Thank you, Ben. So, um, so far we've been operating on data with synthetic PHI and focused on the what's the green box here, the um, MIDI Google <coughs> API, uh, did, or data loss prevention DLP uh, platform. And in the next phase we're, that we're about to start in the coming weeks, we'll be using real data with real PHI. And so it's taken a, about a year to have the data transfer agreements in place and other uh, logistics checked off to be able to do this project, including security uh, assurance by the uh, you know security teams that everything is compliant, uh, both on the Google Cloud side as well as uh, NCI and NIH. So, uh, what we are trying to do is to benchmark the performance of uh, first evaluate the performance of the MIDI pipeline on data with real PHI, real original data that's not been processed, 
um, and then compare its performance to TCIA. TCIA that's been mentioned a couple of times is the Cancer Imaging Archive, which has which uh, been around for 11 years, and it's very well known in the community of researchers uh, for access to imaging data. So that's the other imaging repository that NCI has, and uh, what we're focused on is imaging data commons, which is cloud-based. Um, so if you imagine a diagonal line across this, this graphics, the upper part, the purple, uh, boxes and the, the uh, CTP box that's brown, it's the way it's TCI operates. So once the data submitter agrees to, you know, once data submitter is approved to submit their data to TCIA, TCIA provides a local version of CTP, uh, which is an open source the identification tool developed by Radiological Society of North America many years ago, and it's sort of standard in the community. So you can set the profile for CTP to de identify to the level that, that you want, and it's compliant with, with or legal um, you know, requirements, etc. So TCI makes a, a version of the CTP available locally. The institution de-identifies their data set images and sends it to TCIA and they do a second check or the screening of the de-identification. And then they publish the data after some quality assurance measures, um, like checking for any burn pixels, uh, etc. that might be in the data set or um, what have you. So, and then in the lower part of the, the, the Diagram is the media operation. So what we want to do is to compare the performance of media to TCIA and adjust that profile. That's the, the delta that's shown on the right uh, to adjust the identification profile until the output of both uh, both arms of the experiment are uh, are identical or or the differences are acceptable. So that way we can benchmark against TCIA, which by by far is really the community standard or gold standard for image identification. They do a great job of uh, curating data. So uh, this is the next phase. It's going to include 300 some subjects with multimodality images. And once we do that and show that uh, feasibility and e efficacy of, of um, the identifying real data sets, then the next steps would be to, uh, to take uh, measures for putting this into production and operationalizing it. Um, but so there are several steps after that that could be uh, explored. And those include developing an end-to-end uh, data curation, data submission, the identification, and quality assurance uh, pipeline that could take care of not only DICOM images, but also other medical images, including digital pathology, which was mentioned this morning. Um, and those, in some ways, are easier to de-identify because they have a label uh, slide, and typically that could be um, blurred out or, or de-identified in other measures. And very rarely, especially nowadays, there's uh, markups in the, in the slides uh, that a pathologist might have made, and those could be done, um, dealt with, with optical character recognition that, that Ben talked about. Uh, so, um, so there's a lot of possibilities once we get past the next stage. And um, uh, although we started with the incentive for this project being providing image identification services to the imaging data commons at NCI, but because of um, the data sharing mandate, uh, we now have a bigger cause and really want to be able to provide some service to the community of scientists, uh, NIH scientists, to, to be able to share their data. And we find that this to be in resonance with uh, the ARPA-H that was mentioned, their biomedical data fabric, which is about uh, you know, best practices in standardizing data curation and provenance, et cetera. So there's, a, there's more roles for, for this kind of approach. Um, and I think that's the last slide. I want to acknowledge there are many um, people involved with the MIDI project and several teams, um, obviously folks from NCI, uh, Deloitte, uh, Ben Jorgen and colleagues at Deloitte that are listed. I um, want to acknowledge the help of folks at Google, including Dave Blardo and, and Patrice and uh, Cheryl Corman. And uh, of course, we have people like Dave Clooney, who's the editor of DICOM Standard and very interested in image identification involved with this project, and Fred Pryor, who's the uh, principal investigator of TCIA because they're looking at ways to also hopefully modernize their approach to image identification. And the reason we chose Google Cloud initially was because the imaging data commons is implemented on, on GCP, so it was a natural choice, but through the course of this project, we've learned that although other cloud providers have some of the identification tools, but uh, really the Google Healthcare API is, is perhaps the most advanced and also most customizable. Uh, and even with that, we're working on, on improving the, the process. So um, that was the reason we went with this. 
with this choice, but really the cloud approach is to make the identification scalable because the TCI operation, for instance, is, is a combination of man and machine in the identification. But uh, to me, if th this is a routine, uh, repeatable process that's all digital. So there's really, uh, we should be able to automate this process as much as possible and really take advantage of uh, AI enablement of, of the process. Because the more that the system trains on additional data, the, the more robust it will become. And then you can address other things beyond the identification. So I'll stop here and thank my colleagues and, and you for your attention. Thank you. You're crossing institutes in NIH. This means that you probably want to operate these pipelines in the same Google region, regardless of the institute. Is that how you see it evolving? In the same cloud region, you mean? Yes. I think that has mostly to do with the economy of scale and how much it will cost. Um, but yeah, those have to be decided. So the example that Ben showed was operating in the, I think, West region or in, in the East Coast region, yeah, central region of, of GCP. But yeah. The, the other question is, the, I was puzzled by the 17 milliseconds per, per 200 old slide image. I'm guessing this has, to, has something to do with the parallelization, right? The model cannot be that fast, or is it? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, first the model is very fast, uh, but yeah, it is also parallelized. So it's a, uh, it's a serverless function, so it gets to scale with how many images we have in the available compute that Google uh, is basically allowing us to use. You, you, you don't know from the logs how many machines were involved? Uh, we could check. I, I didn't take a look, <laughs> but uh, we can look. Thank you. And maybe Jonas, for the uh, if you noticed on the multi-regional, um, that was almost a tenfold, uh, ten, ten factor ten slower. Uh, if we happened to get into the region through a multi-region setup in which the healthcare API was actually no natively deployed, then even the multi-region was pretty fast. Um, but if it happened to be picking a region where that wasn't the case, it needed to sort of work around and, and that caused some of the delays. So as you go through your project, you're really making a nice set of data that includes uh, images with PII and their de-identified counterparts. Have you tried re-identifying the de-identified images so that you have confidence that they're truly de-identified? We haven't got to that point yet, because so far we've been dealing with synthetic PHI, but after the next phase, we could do that. There are people who are interested in re-identification as a way to, for quality assurance of the identification, I suppose. Um, I think that's a worthy effort be, you know, going down a rabbit hole because there could be so many different approaches to de-identification, re-identification. So uh, it depends on use cases, I guess, but, but that's an important point. Yeah. The um, best practices that were developed uh, together with Dave Clooney and others um, really are focused on making sure that that is as hard as possible. Um, as you probably know, um, head CTs are already clear that you can easily reconstruct uh, an image out of that and you almost see the actual person then. So no matter what you do there, you know, you could probably de-identify, re-identify that. Um, and, and see the individual in front of you. Uh, so those are things where I guess organizations where such as the Imaging Data Commons will have to decide how to handle those types of images then in the future. Yeah, but, but th even tools like defacing could be incorporated into this pipeline. So if you have a head and neck scan, then it would trigger the defacing protocol and or algorithm and would deface the defacing is essentially blurring out the facial features of the subject in every slice so you cannot reconstruct the face uh, through 3D reconstruction and, and match it with the photograph of the person. Hello, Chun Li Ding from Celerance. So do patients need to consent for their data to be used? Yes, these are consented before they're shared, of course. But once they're shared and or they identified then the, the data is no longer human subject research. It's not considered human subject research once it's de-identified. 
Are there any regulations or requirements you need to consider, such as uh, GDPR or similar? I'm not familiar with GTP. Uh, GDPR is European. Oh, GDPR, data, yes. Yeah, uh, we are focused on US use case right now. And GDPR, from what I understand, doesn't specify um, specific actions to be taken. It provides some guidelines, but it's much more restrictive than, um, than HIPAA, from what we understand. So in our workshop, we had representatives from EU and Canada to talk about their approaches to image de-identification. Th thank you for sharing all that. Uh, appreciate it very much. This is Hemant Bundele from Abbey Launch. You might have shared this. I might have missed this, but I'm going to still ask. What tool are you using to identify the text on the images and then remove? Did you? I believe it's an OCR tool, optical character recognition. Any, so any specific or? I don't know the specifics. I don't know if Ben does. Uh, the, it's all contained within the healthcare API. Yeah, so, so the Google Healthcare API sits on top of Google's data loss prevention service. And it's an embedded function that we call that is pre-trained by Google on doing precisely what we we, sh we showed you for the imaging data, just for the pixel data, for the DICOM headers. That's where we went the configurable route. So we heavily configured it to make sure that every DICOM field would be de-identified as per the best practices. Uh, so that's. But the uh, imaging part is a pre-trained algorithm by Google and provide us the healthcare API as a service. So the use of DICOM is critical, right? That has to, that image. Correct. Uh, okay, yes. got it. Thank you. Although the healthcare API can take other modalities, you can take fire as well if you have textual data. Yeah, and that's another records. point of, sorry, um, interest because we want to think beyond imaging. And if you are collecting medical records, then you can de-identify EHR data, presumably. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kayvon, Ben, and Jurgen. And thank you, Deloitte, for the investment that you've made for many years in Google Cloud technology. And I think the message here is that some folks know Google Cloud or Google Storage. We have Google Healthcare Technology Solutions that no one else can provide. So I urge you to talk to Deloitte and talk to your partner development managers that are here today that support you to find out how you can get um, up to speed on our healthcare solutions, healthcare data engine, healthcare APIs, MetaLM and others. We're here to support you. Uh, we want you to roll up your sleeves and we want you to bring use cases to us that produce real outcomes for our, our uh, joint customers. Okay, so we've talked about this throughout the day, but our final presentation is, we saved the best for last, is for security. So I wanna introduce Ron Bouchard. Um, there you are, Ron. Uh, the Managing Director of Mandiant Solutions at Google Public Sector and Jim Schmid, the CTO at Palo Alto Networks. They're gonna be talking about Operation Warp Speed, addressing cyber threats to the healthcare sector. So thank you, Ron right. and Jim. Which yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, Patrice, I think, uh, you know, put a good spin on this, but we saved the worst news for, or the worst, uh, talk track for last in terms of bad news. I, I love listening today uh, about all the innovation and amazing capabilities we're starting to see come together in the healthcare sector, right? From patient outcomes, research and development, all this great technology being brought to bear, not just on the data side, but on, you know, direct patient care, right? The, the trick that we all have to deal with, or not the trick, but the challenge we have to deal with is, of course, there's a lot of risks when we start getting into this space and we have to be very, uh, we have to acknowledge those risks, but we also have to understand how best to combat them and protect what we're trying to build here from a healthcare outcomes perspective. So before I get started, Jim, do you want to say a couple words uh, on the Palo Alto side? Sure. Just to introduce myself, Jim Smith, I'm the field CTO for uh, DOD and for Intel. I also cover a lot of the rest of public sector with my teammates. 
and you know appreciate you having me here and the partnership with Google. We do a lot of our our SaaS offerings are in conjunction with uh, riding Google's cloud. A lot of Google's uh, behind the scenes work they utilize us for a lot of their security components, cybersecurity components. So we appreciate the partnership and look forward to it. Great, thanks, Jim. Yeah, and. I think you heard it sprinkled throughout today's presentations, you know, this emphasis on everything that Google is trying to do both on our own platforms and with our partners has security baked in, right? It has security as a foundational element of how we think about this from the AI components, AI safety, AI transparency to how we think about securing our own platforms and how we think about securing workloads and capacity for our partners and, and, and um, for the people who are using these systems on a daily basis. We've done that for historical reasons as a company, but we also see it as the future, right? You can't work in an industry like this and a sector like this without trust. And trust starts with having confidence in the security you're bringing to um, what you're putting into these platforms, right? And the outcomes that are coming out of them. So this storyline today that we're gonna talk about is, I'm gonna give you a lot of bad news. I'm just telling you that up front about where the threat actors are today and, and what they're trying to do and what they are doing, unfor unfortunately. Then we're gonna pivot and talk a little bit about how to, how to combat that and how to reduce those risks and think about this entire ecosystem in a more secure way. But we bring it, you know, we're bringing this visibility, this, this idea of trusted expertise and security and next generation capabilities to bear from a security challenge perspective. I wanna start out with the policy side of it. I think you've heard a lot of discussion and we've, I, I know a lot of people in this room have a lot of expertise, deep expertise in how healthcare, you know, for the past 20, 25 years has thought about compliance and policy drivers that have to do, had to do primarily, I would argue with privacy, right? Protect, protection of patient data, privacy data, HIPAA uh, and PHI data. And I would argue that healthcare sector is really at the vanguard of a lot of cybersecurity initiatives focus on privacy, confidentiality, protecting confidentiality and integrity of information. All for great reasons, right? No argument that it needed to be done in order to have trust in taking what used to be paper-based systems and putting them into digital formats. The challenge we're dealing with today is frankly, the healthcare sector has moved on, right? We are, we've moved from um, data being a back office component of how we think about healthcare or data systems and primary, primarily thinking about the protection of that data from a privacy perspective to digital systems, cloud systems, uh, AI systems, you know, all these things are now front and center in patient care. They're, in, they're incorporated, they're embedded, and they're required to provide uh, capabilities in the research space, in the, in the healthcare sector space, in, in emergency care. All of those elements are now, they don't work without um, the technology behind them, frankly, right? And we've seen evidence of this. When bad actors get access to these systems and make them unavailable, so now we're in the availability side of that risk quadrant, you have, um, you have catastrophic, potentially catastrophic outcomes, right? Or catastrophic risks. And so what we've seen a pivot to in, in this chart here is left-hand side really started with uh, privacy regulations and compliance co regimes. We're moving towards a recognition that the healthcare sector is a critical sector, right? In, the, in, in our country uh, and the availability of the healthcare sector, right? From again, from critical care, emergency care, all of those elements that now is front and center with a lot of the regulations, executive orders we're starting to see. So the focus has shifted to how do you continue to operate systems, medical systems that are under attack, right? Or that are attempt that are being uh, accessed or attempt to be accessed by bad actors on a regular basis for the exact reason to hold them hostage from an availability perspective to get either a financial payout or in some cases, as I'll talk about, hold that risk, right? From a nation state perspective, potential threat, threats to essentially civil order you know, within the country. I hate to be so dramatic, but we are seeing some of that. So you're seeing these regulations shift to, an, to the concept of operations of healthcare systems, not just protection of privacy and data. <clears throat> and again, that touches on here, you know, we've seen an executive order touching on this. It wasn't directly aligned to just healthcare sector, but it's definitely in there from a, a conceptual perspective. We're seeing um, medical devices and cybersecurity of the software that goes into medical devices as being now a new regulation from the FDA. So you don't, again, not just the privacy of that data, but how do you secure and ensure that there aren't embedded implants or malware or other sorts of, um, you know, 
bad things in software that you're putting into medical devices and making that transparent to the users of those devices. And then new standards we expect to see coming out of CISA and other uh, regulating bodies around cybersecurity in the, in the coming years uh, you know, because of these risks that we're seeing. So I would touch on four key areas that I, I think we're seeing a shift in threats and motivations. Again, in the past, it was, let me steal some data. Maybe I'll ransom that data for a payout. Uh, maybe it's useful to me from a state sponsor perspective to understand, you know, targeting of individuals, for example. And that was really the extent of it. Now we're dealing with, as you heard today, all this academic alignment, right? Cutting edge research and technology that has uh, economic benefits and outcome benefits for billions of people, probably trillions of dollars when you add it all up, right? And so this intersection of cutting edge R&D in the academic sector combined with our healthcare system and research grants, right? That's a huge target for a number of um, organizations out there and governments, frankly. Um, obviously, hospitals, emergency services, we, we recognize now, you know, post-pandemic, how critical those capabilities are. And again, as we modernize, you know, intake systems, um, triage systems in, in, health, in frontline healthcare, those systems become very at risk from an availability perspective. Um, in, in the medical device acceleration, a lot of that we, we talked about today. You, you, of course, many of you are, again, at the cutting edge of what we can do with um, amazing technology. But again, if, you, if that technology can't be trusted and it could, has potential catastrophic out, uh, impacts to patient health if it's compromised, you have to question whether it'll ever be allowed right, to be used. So we, we have to think about prevention in that, in that category very significantly. And then I'm gonna touch a little bit more on why there's been so much, not just criminal sponsored or financial actor uh, focused intent in this sector for a long time, but why we're starting to see a pivot to nation state actors and why they care about this sector so much. So on the extortion side or on the financial outcome side, this is this has evolved, right? It's evolved from a simple smash and grab type of activity where I break into a healthcare provider, I steal some records, I hold that those records hostage, or maybe I um, I lock up some systems and I, I uh, ransom those systems for recovery, right? You can see what we call now this multifaceted extortion, which is a combination of stealing data, um, making systems unavailable through crypto, uh, through locking up systems um, through encryption, in some cases completely wiping entire segments of networks or systems, and essentially putting additional pressure points on organizations to, for a quick payout, right? This has had a huge um, expansion in the past couple of quarters. That chart you see on the left, those are what we call multifaceted. It's so not just one variant of extortion, but multiple uh, mechanisms for extortion and payout in the past uh, couple of quarters going back to 2020. And you can see the trend line, right, up and to the right. Then if we ho hone in specifically on the healthcare sector, on the right-hand side chart, this is the past three months of 2023, um, you know, the number of incidents we've seen that have multifaceted extortion targeting the healthcare sector, you can see it's the fourth most targeted sector uh, according to our data, right? So might not be at the top of the list, but it's certainly in, in the running, unfortunately, as a, as a major component of, of payouts and targeting from a financial crime actor perspective. And then if we break it down from a subset perspective, the way we see visibility in this space, um, it kind of lands where you would expect, right? Wherever there's the most pressing, most urgent, most uh, impactful um, outcomes, outcomes being negative outcomes from an attacker perspective, that's where you see the volume of activity happening. So top of the list is healthcare facilities, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, next is medical equipment and suppliers, right? Uh, and then you see healthcare providers. So that's you know, frontline doctor offices, things of that nature. So where you're, again, either dealing with patient records or patient intake and those sorts of things. And then you move down the list and there's other areas that are more interesting from a more of a economic advantage uh, perspective. So biotechnology uh, and healthcare support services and research and development are also being targeted, right? Um, with this type of criminal activities. So this is kind of the, the trend line is heading in the wrong direction. It has been for a long time. And I would argue that we haven't necessarily or really even come close to solving this problem, right? The actors are extremely creative in this space. In fact, many of you are probably aware of the United Healthcare um, breach that happened last week. I can talk about it at a very high level here because it's become public. 
it's become public because of that previous note I mentioned, which is that SEC regulation, right? So United had to file an incident report based on a 72-hour reporting period. Um, we are supporting that investigation along with Palo Alto as a partner there. That's been publicly named. Um, that we, we think early indications are it's, a, it's an extortion uh, gr criminal gang uh, called Black Cat or Alpha H or Alpha V, sorry. Um, very nasty set of actors who have no qualms about um, doing anything they can to get a, a quick payout from their victims. Um, and the, the impact you see there, you know, from an early investigative standpoint is, again, not necessarily something that's catastrophically impacting a wide swath of networks and systems across United Healthcare's infrastructure, but a single partner potentially where you don't, you lose trust in the ability and the connectedness of those um, interconnected uh, organizations and partners. And therefore you have to, you feel the need from a risk-based perspective to essentially shut down the entire network, right? From an insurance perspective. Um, and so it's impacting or has been impacting, unfortunately, things like uh, the ability to fill prescription medication requests and things of that nature. So that's an example where you don't necessarily have to get to the pharmacy system that's actually dispensing the medication, for example, which is uh, certainly a risk that we have to think about. But if I can impact the information systems around that process, and make them unavailable, it really doesn't matter, unfortunately, at the pharmacy level, you can still significantly disrupt patient care, right? Which is a huge impact uh, that we all have to think about. This is another example. I won't get into the technical details here, but there are specific groups. Um, Black Cat is an example of kind of a wide ranging criminal gang that uh, operates across all a, a multitude of sectors. Um, there are specific groups that we track that are very, very healthcare specifically focused. And you can see the statistics here for this one group. Um, they use a multitude of tools and technologies and capabilities and TTPs, tactics and techniques that are really honed in on the healthcare sector in particular, and they, they've gotten really good at it, unfortunately. So you see the victims and especially the geographies here. North America and Europe in most of these cases are going to be the two most heavily targeted uh, regions of the world from when it comes to things like criminal activity and healthcare space. And then lastly, I want to leave you with something that is over the horizon a little bit, but it's very concerning from a national security perspective. So we, we've been tracking a number of Chinese based uh, nation state espionage groups for a long time. Again, most of the history of China based APT groups has been focused on espionage outcomes, some economic advantage, learning new capabilities, research, those sorts of things. We have indications now that there's a separate motivation embedded within um, China's government, government to think about future conflict, right, with the United States in particular, and what pressure points they could put, you know, during a potential um, uh, military conflict with the United States. And so we have a, a, a number of indications about explicit targeting uh, for the purposes of disruption, not for espionage, not for data theft, but embedding capabilities so that in a future conflict, they can make those systems unavailable, destroy them essentially to some level, right? You think about the early days of the Ukraine conflict, something similar happened with Russia where they took out things like SATCOM communications, civilian infrastructure for a period of time during that initial phase of conflict. I think a lot of our adversaries in the world are learning, looking and learning from some of these conflicts about what to pre-position and what areas are most sensitive to disruption um, from a conflict perspective. And healthcare is squarely in that targeting phase. It's certainly not at the top of the list. I mean, you can think about military systems, logistics, things of that nature, but wherever there's a pressure point and a vulnerability, frankly, where there's a potential for disruption, especially in a massive scale, um, we do have indications that, that China is interested in that and is exploring ways to stay embedded in those systems over a long period of time. And we have two examples recently that we observed, again, through a university affiliation. So I keep going back to kind of a vulnerability matrix, if you will, or where we have vulnerabilities in the systems. Certainly on the cutting edge, you know, uh, when we're developing new tools, new software, new medical devices, there's a supply chain risk area, but then we also see this intersection of research and development universities where those systems are tied together and vulnerabilities in one leads to access and vulnerabilities across a, a wider swath of uh, a large scale infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure. So all these are kind of the indicators of why we need to take this situation extremely seriously. And we need to think about not just point solutions, but 
wider, more fundamental, right, more holistic security outcomes for the entire healthcare industry and build secure from the start, right? So at Google, we always talk about secure by design and secure by default, not just let's think about security after we built the whole thing and hopefully we can tack some fencing around the building, right, after we built it. We want to build security into the entire ecosystem so that there's confidence and trust and security from the start, right? Um, and the ability to not only protect against these types of attacks, but if the inevitable does happen, we can see it, we can respond to it, we can react to it, we can operate under a little bit of duress. So almost like you know a, a medical triage, right? We can triage the patient, keep them alive, keep keep the systems working, address the problem, kick the attackers out, um, make sure they don't have the impact that they're looking for on our systems, our critical systems, and continue to operate. And that's the, the mindset that we have to bake into everything we do um, as technology providers and as um, really as solution providers in this industry. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jim now and talk a little bit more about maybe the more positive side of this. What, what can we do about this specific to a couple of areas of, of healthcare? I don't know, I might scare you a little more. Uh... I'll try to keep it as positive. Palo Alto Networks, if you don't know, we're the largest cybersecurity company in the world. So all the things you've been hearing about today, the cool new applications, all the medical devices, our job is to help you make them secure, right? We're going to take all these devices. We're going to make sure that the right people have access to it. The right applications are being used by the right people. The data is being shared by the people that are supposed to do it. I had three people come by in about a half an hour span that asked me the research data that I'm sharing. How do I ensure nobody else can see that research data? So a lot of that gets under this umbrella of zero trust. You probably heard zero trust, right? I, people ask me about zero trust every day. Zero trust is this huge umbrella of ideas. It's, it's just a concept of how to secure your data. And it looks at all of those things. Who are your users? What applications do you have? What devices do you have? What does your network look like? And what is your data that you're trying to secure? And then on top of that, how do you automate things? How do you use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning? And, and how do I have reporting and visibility across my enterprise for all those? So those are really the seven pillars of zero trust. That's where we play. We have the biggest portfolio in the industry in terms of getting all of those different zero trust pillars addressed. And where we don't have our tools that do it, we have very close partnerships with people like Google, other folks in the industry that we, we cover those gaps and we work together. A lot of the use cases for zero trust they take multiple tools. You can't do it with just a silver bullet. So we work very closely with our partners to make sure that we're keeping all of these things secure. And one of the things I wanna focus on today, just in, uh, in light of where we're at and what we've talked about so far is all these connected medical devices out there. They're great. They make for a better user experience, a better care for your patients. It's uh, making it easier to do the things and share the information you need to. But what does that mean? It means we have this exploded attack surface. So the industry says there'll be about 1.3 billion devices, medical devices, by 2030. What does that mean from an attack surface? A lot of these things that we just heard about are coming in with, they're coming into your network through these devices. So you know, a lot of the most famous ones you've heard about, those exploitations started with a device that you would never have thought of being connected to the rest of your infrastructure. And you've got to protect that entire attack surface as, as well as you can. So you'll see some of the, the specific things, and, and you've already had some of you this scared into you a little bit, but the patient leak data, um, these, these hospital operations being halted, this is a huge thing. A lot of the networks that we see today, everything is flat. And what I mean by that is the network devices that have, or for medical devices, are on the same network and they haven't been segregated, nothing's happened as the regular IT uh, infrastructure. So what's the first thing that happens when a cybersecurity analyst finds out they've had an intrusion? They shut everything down. They shut everything down until they can figure out what happened. That's what happened back in 2017. It affected over, I think it was 70,000 uh, users. And the, the problem with that is that you have to have your IoT, your medical devices segregated off so that if you have something that has to be addressed by your IT department, 
those devices continue to work and they work. It's no different than manufacturing. It's no different than any other OT environment. You have to have uptime. It has to critically be available to your patients, right? And to the doctors and to the clinicians. So that's really what we're trying to do with this, with this IOT side. We don't want to disrupt uh, the, the services. We don't want your patients to be impacted. And you know, this is a statistic that goes back and it says 2021, 82% of healthcare organizations have experienced a cyber attack on medical devices. Well, I would say, I would say that a little differently. I'd say 82% know that they had uh, an exploit, right? How many didn't know they had it? And what does that number look like? Because it is exponentially growing in terms of how many devices we have out there and what a concerted effort that he just talked about in terms of people focusing on our healthcare industry. This is another slide, I guess, to kind of scare you a little bit, just to talk about over half of the medical devices have vulnerabilities that are vulnerable to medium and severe attacks. Think about that, and again, the number of devices. So I live in Tampa, or I live a little south of Tampa, but one of the medical, one of the, the healthcare providers, uh, the hospitals there, not a huge one, 33,000 medical devices. They used our solution and they came in to automatically discover using machine learning and using signature base to automatically discover all those devices. They had no idea they had that many devices out there. If you have 33,000 devices and over 50% of them have medium and severe vulnerabilities, you have a huge problem on your hands. So how do you take care of that? What I'm gonna talk about is how we use our tools, how we try to keep you focused on providing care for your patients and not in the cybersecurity uh, business, which is, it's, it's technical and it's difficult. So, Hey Jim, can I just sure. pivot on that? What, one thing you had up there really quickly as a, as an additional point I wanted to make here, um, you know, that FDA regulation around software and embedded devices and, um, software uh, bill of materials, they purposely in that regulation wrote in that it's only for new device applications starting in March, I think of 2023, they intentionally left out the entire tale of um, like call it legacy technology. Why did they do that? Well, I think there's a recognition that going back, especially in devices that are actually, you know, being used in um, critical care, for example, it's almost impossible at this point, maybe to try to fix those real time. There's probably additional risks if you try to go back and like I said, put that fence up after the fact with those specific devices. So you have to think about kind of a point in time solution now where you have to think about this legacy tale of um, of technology that we have to we have to think about how we protect it maybe from um, the wider attack surface that Jim was talking about and then going forward how do we bake in more capable security solutions for the new generation of technology a lot of which we heard today right so I think about this as a, as a two-step solution process that we have to really think through how do we protect our, our old older legacy technology which we know has vulnerabilities and a lot of them likely will never be fixed for their entire lifespan? And then how do we look at learning from that and making sure that the new generation of capabilities are mo much more easy to defend, protect, patch, and keep those vulnerabilities from becoming catastrophic? Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, one of the, one of the statistics here, 83% are, are powered by end-of-life OSs. So those, are, those are OSs that they're never gonna have those vulnerabilities fixed. The whole idea, idea of these medical devices is they don't have the same kind of a life cycle that I think about in the IT world, right? We don't refresh every three years. Things are around for 10 years, 15 years, the life cycles are much different. They have very old, vulnerable OSs on them. So how do you do this? How do you do it quickly? How do you do it automatically? And we'll get into a little bit of, of what that looks like. So uh, this is really one of our products is medical IoT security, but uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. I won't really call it a product as much as I'll call it a feature because what we believe in at Palo Alto Networks is delivering a platform and then to just be able to turn on with the applications and the features and the functionality that you want. So inherent to our firewalls, inherent to other products like our remote access for remote users, uh, our Prisma access uh, products, you can turn on IoT security and it's important to be able to marry what you do from the OT side and what you do from the IT side because why not have a consistent place to address policy, have a consistent place to look at 
cybersecurity as a whole instead of looking at this in silos. I don't want you to have an OT environment that doesn't talk to the rest of your network. Why not do it in a, in a place that is all connected, it's using the same data, it's sharing data, and I can do enforcement at the same place that I'm doing my discovery. So that's a lot of what we talk about. Um, number one point is really I talked about if you don't know what it is or you don't know it's there, you can't secure it quickly discover and access every device. So using our tools, it automatically detects it for you. Using machine learning, using signature base, you can detect every tool, every device that's on the network, step one. And then you, step two, you can start segmenting things and applying zero trust. And rather than have to teach everybody how to do zero trust, the thing that we do with our products, we already know how these products behave. I can do anomaly detection. I can see if it's doing something it shouldn't. I know where it should be segmented in your network. And I can provide you with a one click. I can apply all this policy based on what I know about that device. And you can just one click your administrator. So think about instead of manually doing 33,000 devices, I can just say, okay, do the recommendations. How much have I already taken the low-hanging fruit away from what my attack surface looks like? I've made it very simple for your, your clinicians, for whoever it is that's in charge of looking at some of these things to just take some recommendations, do best practices. Everything we do, it comes from crowdsourced telemetry. That means we, could, we uh, collaborate with the rest of industry to make sure that we're following best practices for you and we make it easy for you to implement. That means things like MDS2, which is nothing more than the, the medical device manufacturers telling you what vulnerabilities are in there. We, we take all that telemetry information, we take the CEV information, we take what we learn as the biggest cybersecurity company in the world, and we apply that so it's easy for you to fix the, the IoT devices you have. Protection against known and unknown threats. I mean, really, that's a lot of the scary stuff that we have coming in. That's inherent to the tools we have. And lastly, simplify your operations. This is not a, another point product. You don't have to learn a new tool. You don't have to go out and hire four or five more cybersecurity engineers, which are hard to find. You can simply turn it on and you can deploy it very quickly. We don't use sensors. You don't have to go deploy a lot of sensors, which a lot of our competition has to do. This is just inherent to what the, the firewall does for you. And you get that, that return on investment back in terms of not having that overhead in terms of what you're trying to do. Yeah, I, I want to point something out, Jim, on that point. Um, I think I heard from an, an earlier speaker up here, uh, it might have, been, might have been the Cleveland Clinic or another research facility where they, he talked about lack of cybersecurity resources, right? He said maybe they have one or two in the entire hospital system or something along those lines. I think the healthcare sector is in a place in time right now, unfortunately. You know, when you think about another heavily targeted sector like finance, right? Well, you go back to Bonnie and Clyde days, right? It was like, why do you rob banks? Well, that's because where the that's where the money is. So, finance, you know, industry has thought for a long time about how to secure their their operations. I don't think most people in healthcare thought about their themselves as a bank or a victim of bank robbery, but that's where you are today, right? From a number of elements or a number of risk areas, and so you're being forced to conceive of how to think about um, securing these systems, these this infrastructure much more rapidly and in, in, in innovative ways that we didn't, that we had much more time to do with other industries that were early days of, of cyber attack, let's say. And so I think the point of simple solutions, secure platforms, and the ability to make it really, really easy, powered by you know things like AI, right? Make it as easy as possible for people who don't necessarily have the budget or the expertise to have a fighting chance and really be able to, to, to up their level of um, cybersecurity almost automatically. And that's where, really where we're trying to go with these solutions between Google and Palo. Yeah, appreciate that. It's, it's really about that scalability. It's about driving efficiency. It's about being able to determine what is signal versus what is noise. We've heard so much today about artificial intelligence and the things you can get from it. And one of the biggest things we get from a cybersecurity standpoint is being able to really quickly be able to determine that signal and to take what can be literally hundreds of thousands of alerts and boil it down to you know, 100 or so things that somebody needs to take a look at and then to automate a lot of those so that those can be, be taken care of without having that, that cybersecurity analysts have to step in and, and do something about it. How do you do, uh, you know, even usage? So not only do I get my inventory, 
how do you know of those 33,000 devices, which of them are not being used, which of them are, are barely being used? So how do you gain these efficiencies? It, it Not only from a cybersecurity standpoint, but just think about that from a return on investment in terms of using the infrastructure that you've purchased and you've gone out and you're deploying today. So that's all part and inherent of what you get out of the tool. I talked again about segmentation. Segmentation, just to remind you, it's so important that you can automatically have the tool suggest to you these devices belong in this part of your network and they are segmented away from other places so that they can't cross pollinate or you can't have a, a once somebody's in, they can't travel across the network north or east to west and go into another application or for, to another device. Um, and, and that critical piece of how do I make sure that my medical devices continue to work if I have to take down another part of my infrastructure. So this idea of these flat networks, it's, uh, it's really difficult for uh, people to manage. And we take a lot of that and automate it and make it in a way that your, your cybersecurity analysts and your network folks can start doing this very, very quickly. Known and unknown threats, I mean, you know, whether it's malware, you know, what you think about how sophisticated some of these, these threats have become. And, you know, I, I see it every day. I, my family is always coming to me and saying, well, you know, I got this email or I got something. And they know so much about you from the information that's been shared out there. There's so many leaks that have happened and things like that. It's really important that the tools you're using know how to not only get signature-based attacks, but to just know in terms of uh, what it's seeing and how it's behaving and protect you and your users from letting them in and, and getting a malicious payload into your network or into your applications or into your devices. And this playbook-driven incident response, that again goes back to your operations team. How do I make sure, you know, if then what? If I have something bad happen, what do I do about it, right? And how do I automate those things? How do I make it less manual and more automated? Uh, simplifying your operations, you can deploy this in minutes. Uh, a lot of the uh, tools out there are specific to OT and you have to stand up a completely siloed infrastructure. A lot of them you have to deploy the sensors uh, throughout your network. We don't do that. Everything is done because the network traffic is coming through. We do all of our artificial intelligence and machine learning at that network layer, and we don't have to do that. So that's a huge payback in terms of what you have to uh, operate and what you have to go and deploy. And then last, I'll just, uh, I'll just I will open it up to some questions, but uh, I, I'll just hit on a couple things. These are huge differentiators, I think, for Palo Alto Networks. Number one, just the platform. We have the biggest breadth of tools. That means those tools are integrated together. They already share data. Anything, anytime you want to do any kind of automation, orchestration, artificial intelligence, it's all about the data, and we share that data inherently uh, instead of having these siloed tools. Uh, we can discover at scale if you have 10, 10 devices or if you have 33,000 or if you have 200,000 devices, Install a tool and let the network do its thing. It will automatically discover and tell you, report back, what's your usage, what's your inventory, what's my attack surface look like. We have the best of class protection. Our firewalls from day one have been you know, one of the best in the business, and we, you know, we invented this whole idea of the platform. There are a dozen different tools that you used to buy independently that are now inherent to what the features and functionality are of our next generation firewalls, including being able to turn on IoT uh, security. Automating zero trust, so that one click, and these integrated workflows. Again, how do I make things automated so that I don't have my operators have to do more than they should? Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just close with this. I mean, we want to think about in terms of, you know, way left of boom, right, of an event. How do we think about baking security in like we talked about? How do we wrap security around our major platforms and infrastructure, which Jim just talked about? And then you still have to think, right, a boom, just like we think about healthcare insurance, you need catastrophic care insurance in case something goes horribly wrong. Think about having, you know, the ability to, for uh, on-call support. Um, this is where we work together really well um, as, as uh, teammates and, and partners. We, you know, when there's a really hard challenge or a really sophisticated intrusion somewhere, you know, our teams understand the technology we're using and we know these threats better than anyone in the world so we can respond quickly and mitigate and minimize the damage being done. So think about having the ability for a rapid emergency phone call just like you do with 911 
you know, have a hotline number for a cyber incident and the ability to have somebody come in with expertise quickly to, to assist you in that with that problem. Yeah, I'll just end with one other question that came up multiple times today over at the booth, and that was what you just just mentioned. It's about um, you know that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And that's true in the cybersecurity world. I'd rather identify vulnerabilities before they end up in my in my production workspace. We do a lot with the software factories. Think about the folks that are actually creating the applications, the containers, and they are putting them into the cloud. So shifting that left and making the people that are developing your applications part of the cybersecurity team, identify libraries, identify open source code, identify things with known vulnerabilities prior to it ending up into production. So we own that, that securing your cloud workload and working with our partners to make sure we can help you identify all of those things and, and you know, look forward to the partnership going forward. Great, I know you guys have been here um, all day. I really appreciate the, the focused attention and hopefully there's there's been a tremendous amount of um, knowledge and, and understanding and, and information that you've, you've been able to learn today. We have a little bit of time, I think, Patrice, for questions, uh, or are we a little bit over? Okay, so if there's any questions, happy to take those. Yes, sir, do we have a mic? Thank you, uh, Ron and Jim. Uh, you talked, Ron talked about uh, Volt Typhoon, mm -hmm. and um, I read some of your reports from Andy, and actually UNC 3236 how they use um, um, the lay, play of the land, what it was, I forget the word. Yeah, living off the land living, is what it's right, called. Living off the land techniques mm -hmm. so that they don't make themselves visible and all that kind of stuff. And um, and you talked about um, um, how finance and defense and all, all these other industries, whatever, are very actively working against these cyber threats, mm -hmm. whereas the healthcare and the hospitals and the, not so much. And uh, so, I, it sounds to me almost as if, uh, you know, in the scheme of things, that healthcare could be one of the first to get hit hard in a in a geopolitical event. Um, am I right? Uh, I'd say you're not you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there is um, there's concern across a number of sectors. I will say it that way. And and the sectors that I think are most of in, with most concern are the ones that have traditionally not been a focus of significant investments in cybersecurity. So there's other infrastructure providers out there. You can think about transportation, logistics, water. Um, you know that also come into that same category of risk, just simply because they haven't had as much focused effort and attention paid to securing those systems. They have a lot of the same challenges that Jim talked about when it comes to OT risks, physical infrastructure being put at risk because of cyber attack. Um, the, I don't, I'm, I'm not up here to, to be a complete scaremonger. Yes, there are risks and we know our adversaries, uh, you know, have bad intentions to hold some of those uh, in harm's way if they can. I do think really going back to what was on one of Jim's slides, WannaCry was a wake-up call, I think, for the industry in general, right? And that wasn't even intentionally targeted at healthcare, but they just happened to be an extremely vulnerable segment of the infrastructure that got hit by that attack. Um, I think there's been a, a massive amount of investment and focused attention, both from governmental levels, obviously research and development, uh, and frankly, private sector just stepping in and saying, we've got to do a better job here. It's it's critically important. So I think it's, I would say it's, it's, at, it's at risk, but it's one of the most rapidly improving sectors that I'm aware of in this space, which is a good sign. So a little bit of bad news, good news, hopefully. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap? Uh, yeah, just, uh, oh, over here? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. You, you, you can take yeah. from <laughs> uh, So question for Jim. How does your company prevent uh, supply chain attack such as a solar wind uh, incident? Well, I mean, through a lot of the different tools that we have. So our own operations team is one of the first ones in the industry that recognizes solar winds attack. And it's not any one tool. Unfortunately, zero trust is not a one tool thing, right? It, it's, it's not only having all of the right tools, but again, having the platforms that talk to each other and share that data to do anomaly detection to understand what's happening on the network. So uh, there's probably a longer answer to that where we could kind of go through, see what tools you have, what tools you're going to use, and see what gaps there are in analysis in terms of, of what it takes. But SolarWinds is no different than a lot of other attacks in terms of there was anomalies, there was things that happened that we were able to recognize relatively quickly were happening within the network. I'll just add on, I mean, 
obviously sophisticated um, cyber espionage state sponsored group years and years of research and development go, going into that um, you know that capability I think the only way to defeat something like that is a, a layered approach right you have to think about and this is something Google spends an inordinate amount of time and money and, and effort thinking through and, and putting in place which is securing everything from the chip in the in the server in the data center all the way up the stack to where we get open source software and how we integrate it into everything we put into the platform because you have to inspect every stage of that for potential implants and compromise intentional or unintentional right people make mistakes but they also get paid to make mistakes by adversaries sometime or put put things into software that result in you know catastrophic problems later so it's a whole of industry problem that we have to address and it I, it comes with the prevention side and the security you know built in as i said as i said earlier kind of secure by design but it also has to come with this caveat of and the zero trust model is you know it can be applied at the network level but really what it means is literally everything in your environment you have to consider untrustworthy to some extent and it, monitor it right so every person every system every application needs monitoring think about the scale of that the only way you're going to get there is through automation and the only way you're really going to be able to scale it is in cloud-based infrastructure that's our belief that's where we see you know security being able to be baked in from the ground up at scale uh, to be successful against these threats i think we had one other question over here yes sir uh John Evans, NIH, um, you kind of answered the question in regard to Zero's Trust a little bit, but I was wondering how would that be implemented like in a library setting where um, you want to service the public, but you also want to maintain the integrity of the data. Um, so how would that be you know, implemented, the automated uh, Zero Trust security? Do you want to take that? Well, I mean, I, th I think it's really about segregating what things are available to the public, um, understanding which things, uh, you know, from your network. So just think about that, like from a wireless network. Okay, so I might have a guest network that's open to anybody, and you can log in, and there may be some data, some applications, some things you can let anybody on. Uh, but the important part is that you've got the right tools in place so that if you have other people coming on that have, you know, first of all, can get accredited so they can go through the credential, you know, username, password, multi-factor authentication, those kinds of things. And then second of all, authorized to what applications and what data they can see. And then to do that continuously, right? You don't want the, the old days of once I'm in, you can do whatever you want, right? You want to continuously do that. Okay, so I use this application and then I want to use this other application or I, I want to jump somewhere else. You want to be able to do that. And then your tools need to leverage you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning to see anomaly detection. Okay, well, Jim Smith logged on today. He did these three things. He does those three things every day he logs on. Well, what if he starts doing things that are odd, right? That, that's the kind of event that can potentially raise eyebrows, right? Maybe my account has been compromised in some way. Maybe someone has gotten in. So whether it's from a device, whether it's from a user, whether it's from an application, whether it's from you know a medical device, you need to be able to understand how they basically uh, behave on the network and be able to identify those anomalies. And you have to have the kind of segregation in, in terms of your where your data sits, where your applications are sitting, and what users can get access to what. So multiple layers. Yeah, I go, uh, something this gentleman said earlier too, which is living off the land, right? So a lot of sophisticated adversaries, yes, they can they can look at implant types of attacks, but what we're seeing, especially from a number of nation state att attackers now is recognition that tools are getting better at detecting those types of implants. So they're moving to, okay, I'm just gonna behave like a normal user on the network, compromise credentials. And then from there on, I'm essentially using um, all the same capabilities and tools that any other user on the network has, and I don't, I don't really raise a threshold of alarm. So in order to combat that, you really do have to get into really deep, sophisticated behavioral analytics that say exactly what you're saying. Well, you know, Jim's logged on to the system every day for the past year at these times, and then all of a sudden he's logging in from a different location at a different time. Let's flag that for somebody to look at. doesn't mean it's always going to be 100% bad guy, but gives the humans uh, the ability to sift through a huge amount of data and point to the things that are anomalous to, that require more investigation. And that's one way to, to start to defeat those types of um, sophisticated threats as well. One other thing I'll just add on is a lot of the data goes unencrypted. So medical IoT devices are notorious for this. They send unencrypted data. So how are you sending the data in flight? How are you encrypting it? And you know, soon once NIST comes out with the uh, with, with its final recommendations for um, what's going to come out from a um, 
quantum encryption standpoint and come out with it. everybody has really there's a clock starting within within 12 months people are going to have to start thinking about what are they going to do for post quantum encryption how are they going to make sure that not only in flight is it being encrypted and it's in a way that will be uh, resistant to a quantum attack in the future but also um, how do you keep people from just getting that data now and then decrypting it later? So if you have information that's very sensitive, some of our data is extremely sensitive, if that's gonna be still sensitive in five years, 10 years, we don't know when the quantum computers will be fast enough to break PKI, but we know they will be. And it's anywhere from five to 15 years out. You take your best guess. We have adversarial nation states that are actively working on this and they're not sharing how far they are. We don't know how far they are. So. The, the sooner you can get data that's important, encrypted, and make sure you have tools. Again, our firewalls, you can turn on today, 8784, uh, post-quantum encryption. As soon as the other standards come out, we'll be doing those. But that's, it's part of making sure your data is, is secure. All right. Well, really, again, want to thank everyone for the time and attention. I'll hand it back to Patrice to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. On a lighter topic, I think there are cookies delivered over here. So, so I want to thank uh, Jim and Ron. Um, I think security is definitely something that is um, built into all of the Google Cloud offerings, and we'd love to talk with you more if you have, have questions there. Again, thank you to Kerasoft for providing this wonderful uh, event space for all of us. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all of the partners who made this possible. Uh, and just thank you for all the registrants. If you uh, had no idea about Google Cloud Technologies, I think this is giving you uh, a little taste of it. And I'm hoping it will get you curious enough uh, to attend more of these sessions. I'd like the feedback, good or bad. Uh, we are going to have another one of these, um, hopefully, you know, in the next few months. Uh, but please, if there are ideas, suggestions, um, comments on how to make these things better, I'm definitely all ears. I do want to continue conversations with those that are going to be attending HIMSS uh, next month uh, in Orlando. We have a huge Google Cloud and uh, Google Health presence there. So please send me an email and we can set up time to, to sit down. Um, and if you need sub subject matter experts, I'm happy to organize those meetings. And then our biggest conference of the year is April 9th through the 11th in Vegas. Um, it's called Next. Some, are you, some of you are registered. Um, but please look at the tracks. There's a technical track. There's an executive track. This is where Google makes the biggest announcements about technology and partnerships. So I hope to see you at Hims. I hope to see you at Next. I hope to see you all at our next uh, Google Healthcare Symposium. And again, uh, feel free to email me with comments. It's patricew at google.com. And I appreciate everyone that uh, especially sat through the entire day of the sessions. Take care.